Today, we're going to cover kind of like the basics of the class, the overview of what we're going to cover for the next 16 weeks. There's um, 10 units. Some of the units are bigger than other. Um, this one, for example, is not really in depth, but it's got a lot of different stuff thrown together. Um, so jumping into it, you guys know this, this course is going to be brakes and suspension and steering combined. And then we've also added chassis electronics, and that could mean um, ABS, vehicle stability control, even like regenerative braking. So it's a lot of stuff um, that we're going to be covering for you. So what, what that looks like going forward is unit um, introduction is its own standalone thing. Unit one is going to be the brake hydraulic system. So that's going to be um, next week. So next week we'll be talking about the master cylinder, brake fluid, bleeding procedures, um, brake hoses, brake lines, et cetera. And then unit two is the brake power assist. That could be um, a vacuum booster. That could also be um, like, um, let's say it's a forerunner. They have electric over hydraulics. So they have more like an electric motor that gives assist so that's its own standalone unit and then the classic disc brakes and followed by drum brakes so i get a question for you guys do you think we should still cover drum brakes because they're old school we should why because even the new cars we have the drum brakes and for the for the parking brake you know so we have the the outer is a normal brake pad. However, the inside is like drums. Yeah. And even still like a Tacoma may still have drums. So um, years ago, there was quite a discussion about just eliminating drum brakes. And quite a few of us pushed back on that and said, no, nah, I don't think so. We still need to cover drums. So we are. You all learn about drums. You'll probably favor disc brakes. And that's okay because nine out of ten times that's what you'd be working on. But periodically... You will be doing some drum stuff, so we're going to cover it. And then, as you can see, Unit 5 being ABS, VSC, which is Vehicle Stability Control, Chassis Electronics. That's kind of more what I was um, saying. Anything related to electronics and the brake system, that will be covered in uh, Unit 5. And then we're not done because we got 6 is wheel alignment, 7 is suspension, and uh, for the record, wheel alignment, I usually split into two parts. Um, the, initially, wheel alignment can be pretty basic. It's just basically like how to do an alignment. So when you start out, um, and some of you are probably already doing this, you're hired as more of a lube tech, but they may occasionally need an alignment and they may just say, hey, do this alignment. Do you know how? And pretty quickly, I want your answer to be yes. So we're going to cover wheel alignment how to do it early on. Um, we may even do some alignment type of stuff while we're in breaks. However, to really understand an alignment and to really be able to evaluate a car, especially a car that's been in an accident or got something bent or, you know, a car that's given you trouble that's pulling or drifting, um, there's actually quite a bit more to know. So we're going to cover part of it there in the unit six. And then down here, notice unit 10, I'm going to skip ahead, vehicle handling, that may be alignment as well. So when we cover alignments, if you don't, if you can't look at the readings of a car and determine which direction it's going to pull, that's okay. We're going to come back to that again. Um, and then again, we're going to cover suspension systems and, and uh, suspension and steering are going to complement each other well. And you won't totally understand alignments until you understand suspension and steering, which is, again, why we'll cover alignments a little bit more advanced at the end. Um, and then tire and wheel. And sometimes I shift that a little bit earlier. And there's quite a lesson on tire and wheel coming in the next 24 hours. I'm sure you guys have seen the forecast. Um, when, when it rains, that's when you find out if your tires are any good. And so I want to help you... Um, be able to make a good recommendation for a customer. So the recommendations here in Southern California may vary season to season. So being that we're in our rainy season and you can see we got like over an inch of rain forecasted for tomorrow, um, my recommendation on a car today 
maybe a little bit more conservative saying, Hey, you know, you have three thirty seconds left on your, on your tires. That's legal. However, tomorrow and all that rain on those freeways, it's going to be rough. You see, so there's a unit nine is not simply, Oh, tires, they're round and they're black and they hold air. There, there's a little bit more we're going to go into on that. So we got a whole unit on that. And, uh, and then unit 10, that's, that's, that's the one that's going to be um, tying in alignments, but also a lot of times people have suspension issues or steering issues and it causes the vehicle to feel a certain way. So we want to be able to tie all that stuff in. So um, unit 10 also covers noise, vibration, and harshness. So a big um, comeback or a, a big problem for a lot of the shops is, you know, the customer comes back and they say, my car vibrates on the freeway when I'm driving my steering wheel shaking, you know, and, and you could probably guess, you know, it might be, it, it may be tire balance. And if you balance them, it'll probably fix it eight out of 10 times. But what about the other two? I don't want you to be stuck on the two out of 10 times where you've balanced the tires, but it still vibrates. So we're going to really jump into the science of the noise, vibration, harshness. And sometimes that even ties back to brakes as well. So the units one through 10, first five are brakes and the, and the second five are suspension, but you got to look at it a little more holistically. Sometimes your brake performance can be uh, affected by a suspension problem and, and the other way around too. And then bonus material for you, introduction to ADAS. Who knows what ADAS is? Anybody? Go ahead. Unmute. Give the answer away. You can also open up the chat. So advanced driver assist systems. Um, that we could summarize like this, that's getting closer to self-driving. So if you've got a car that warns you that there's a car next to you, kind of like blind spot monitoring, that could be ADAS. But the reason we tie it in with the brake suspension class is for example, a forward facing camera that can tie into the brake system that can tie into lane keep assist, you know, steering with the electronic power steering system. And the main, the main job we do on these ADAS systems is calibrations. So if a vehicle has a windshield replaced, we need to do a calibration of that forward facing camera because it's mounted to the windshield. And when we do that, it's actually most closely tied to an alignment. We need to make sure our alignment's good, but also we need to be on a 100% level surface. And there's one level surface in every Toyota dealership, as far as I know, in the, in the country or, or maybe the world, but I'd say at a minimum, Southern California, one perfectly level surface guaranteed every shop. What is it? What is perfect? the alignment rack? Bingo. So you see, that's why we'll take that ADAS calibration and tie it in with suspension because it's it's the perfect time to do it. They even make adapters for the alignment machine where you can do the ADAS calibrations on the alignment machine with the alignment uh, machine um, at least at least stands in place of where we would do the actual alignment. We'll do ADAS stuff. Hunter actually makes some of it. Um, and so continuing. Right off the bat here, we're going to jump into um, fundamentals of torque, service information, and fasteners. Some of these you'll know. Some of these may be some review. If it's review, we're reviewing. If you forgot, well, I'm going to remind you. And if you never knew, you're going to know now. So the first presentation will be from your favorite company, Snap-on. Um, and the reason why they actually have a really good curriculum on torque, you might remember we cover some of this. Does anybody remember this question? What is torque? Anybody know? Yeah, I think it's related to force. So it's the amount of force that each object can withstand with that, like to meet the specifications. I don't know how to explain it. But... All right. Well, how about I blow your mind with this? 
Torque is a twisting or wrenching effect exerted on a body by equal force acting at a distance on a body equal to the force manipulated. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like just basically uh, twisting force. So that's all. That's it. Mm -hmm. How much you twist something, like say it's an engine, how much torque does an engine make? Or let's say I'll reach right over here. So, <clears throat> Take it out of the case. You all know about the torque wrench, right? So when we're using the torque wrench, this is measuring how much twisting force we're putting on that bolt. And I know that you kind of know that, but we're gonna go a little more in depth. Yes, I put it back in the case. I keep that one very precise. So as we get into torque, we wanna talk about, um, you're going to be doing some more complex jobs this semester. Um, last semester, you were doing mostly electrical diagnosis and things. But this semester, we're going to work toward being able to give you a job and you execute the job on your own with no help. And that means no broken bolts. And that means no bolts that fall out. So that's going to be really the main focus. Um, back in the day, for example, um, Cars were, they were just made a little different. So maybe let's say the engine was cast iron. The cast iron uh, block was a lot more, um, I wouldn't say durable necessarily like for the pistons to go up and down in, but it was durable for people to work on it. If you were, if you were um, torquing the exhaust manifolds, it was a steel bolt going into a cast iron head or block or something you really, there's not much that you could do wrong, right? If you over torqued it, that you'd probably be fine. But um, now, especially as we get into engines and things um, and even calipers, um, generally a lot of brake parts, suspension parts now, they can, they can tend to be aluminum. Sometimes they're even um, a mix of different metals as an alloy, but let's just say aluminum for now. If you're threading a steel bolt into an aluminum brake or suspension part and you over torque it, which part do you think is going to be damaged? The steel bolt or the aluminum component? The aluminum because it's softer. Exactly. So we got to be really careful with this. And that was, that's been a big change for the industry previously, you know, if you tightened it enough to not have it fall out, you were good, but there's a little bit more science behind it. And the simple explanation is when we're working with these types of materials, it's easy to damage the component. You won't strip the bolt. That's what I'm telling you. If you over torque it, you're not going to strip the bolt. The bolt's actually going to rip the aluminum threads out. And now you got a problem. We may be able to solve that problem, but you know what the best practice is? Just don't make the problem in the first place. So this semester, we're going to focus on don't make the problem in the first place. During engines, we're actually going to spend a whole week repairing threads, time certs, helicoils, extracting broken bolts, but that's not really best practice. Everything that I just said, it's amazing if you can extract and, and uh, put a time cert in a broken bolt uh, hole or something, but it still costs time and time is money. So when we're doing this brake suspension steering, you know, chassis type of work, we're trying to be efficient with our time. So we're just going to not break it in the first place. And then part two that I'd like to point out is a lot of parts, especially on steering, they'll have little cotter pins and stuff like that. And that's basically like a just in case you under torqued it, the cotter pin is going to stop it from falling apart. Because just picture it, if it's something in the steering and it completely falls apart, what happens to the car? Clue, they can't steer. So how do you think this is going to go? You lose control of the vehicle. Right. And that's a safety thing. So they, they don't generally put a cotter pin be, you know, like through the drain plug or something. They could, by the way, they could, but they generally don't unless you're running at the racetrack. Sometimes when you run at the racetrack, they'll make you safety wire your drain plug. But generally for automotive, you're allowed to just, you know, 
make sure you torque everything. And sometimes if they're sketched out, they'll put a cotter pin and a steering part because they really don't want you to mess that up. So when we start talking about torque and we're talking about brakes and suspension and steering, it's big time safety stuff. It could be life or death safety stuff. So that's why I want to really drive home torque on our very first day here. So just tighten it, just make it tight. It, it doesn't really work anymore. And so um, I'll, I'll share you a, a little bit of the history, right? So it's important with lug nuts or brake parts, control arm stuff, all that stuff is going to be much more critical to do proper torque on than some of the stuff you guys have been doing last semester. If you were doing electrical work and you took off a door panel, first off, there's probably not a whole lot of things that torque, but the few screws, that's not real critical, right? This semester is critical. So it's different. Now here's a fun um, history about torque. First, it was made by, uh, it was, it was kind of discovered by like Archimedes, but um we will discuss how this is particularly applicable. And I always like to tell this story and I, I'm embellishing a little bit on, on uh, what actually happened, but I'll, I'll tell it to you like this. Who do you think the strongest person is in your class? Take a guess. Edward. Edward. All right. So there you Edward. go. Edward is working for the New York city water department and Edward's jumping down in the sewer and where the pipes bolt together, that's a flange. The pipes have a flange to a flange and a gasket right there. And you have to put a bolt and a bolt and a bolt. There's bolts all in a circle. And Edward, uh, he goes down there bolting up the sections of sewer pipe there in the in New York City sewers. It's where the Ninja Turtles live for the record. So I mean, it's a pretty cool job. But when he tightens the bolts, he tightens, he tightens them Edward style. You know what I'm saying? Edward, Edward tightens them, you know? Edward tight. When you said tight, Edward knows what that means in his terms. And then the problem was, it turns out actually, you know, we made a mistake and now we have to undo the bolts because we need to, you know, we forgot to put the gasket in or something. Now Edward's about to end his shift. So he's not going back down there. Who wants to go down there and loosen up the bolts that Edward just tightened? Anybody? I don't think I want to go do that. Hmm. So let's just say we take, um, hmm. Well, me, I'm old, I'm shot, I'm worn out. You send me down in that sewer hole and I try to loosen those bolts. Like, oh, like this. Oh, I can't do it. I'm going to be, I'm going to be so mad at Edward. Like Edward, what? you over tighten these bolts. What the heck? But I mean, is it really Edward's fault? We told him to tighten them. We didn't really give him a number. We didn't say, Edward, tighten them to 76 foot pounds. We just said, tighten them, right? So that's really what used to happen. Your version of tight was different than my version of tight was definitely different than Edward's version of tight. And so this guy, Conrad Barr, literally back in 1918, over hundred years ago, came up with the idea of the torque wrench. Now, if we said 76 foot pounds or 100 foot pounds, everybody's 76 or 100 foot pounds would be the same. So basically, this torque wrench made it so you could have a standard, right? This created a standard for the amount of torque you're applying to the bolts. And that's going to prevent me from going down there and crying and having to be like, oh, I hurt my arm. That's why I can't get them loose because my arm is hurt. It is, though. It is. I'm just letting you know my arm's kind of kind of weak and it's a little sore. So you know, but if he did it with the torque wrench, I think it could probably at least come up with a hundred foot pounds on do them. And so this was the old style. Some people think this is called a bar torque wrench because it's got a bar right here, but it was actually B-A-H-R. That was the name. Um, and then of course we, they've evolved a bit. Um, we got more into the clicker style. That'd be probably one of your standards that you'd consider buying yourself. <laughs> and we do have electronic and whatnot, but Everybody who's going to be a professional technician needs to have multiple torque wrenches, depending on what you're going to be working on. Now let's talk about how's it expressed. It could be uh, foot pounds. That'd be that'd be the standard for us, you know, because here in America we speak American and, and whatnot. Um, it could be inch pounds, which if you think about it, how many inches are in a foot? Who knows that? 
Don't tell me anything in millimeters or centimeters. I don't care. Hmm. 12 inches to the foot. I know you know that. I can also see the chat. So if you have one foot pound, that's equivalent to 12 inch pounds. Now, the reason that that's important, once in a while, you might, you know, let's say that something calls for seven foot pounds of torque. You may not have a torque wrench that does seven foot pounds. But if you have an inch pound torque wrench, you could do seven times 12. Anybody know what that number is? Don't make me do the math. You guys crunch that number on your own real quick. Let me know. Seven times 12. 84. 84 inch pounds would be the exact same as seven foot pounds. So if you can't come up with seven foot pounds, you can come up with 84 inch pounds, then you're good to go, right? So just know there is a relationship there. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times I was looking to see if I have mine here. Sometimes I have it in my in my to-go bag, which it looks like, yeah, my mine's in my to-go bag. I have a little inch pound torque wrench. It's just quarter inch, nice little um, inch pound torque wrench. Th that is a lot better for precision. So if I have a torque wrench that's good for 10 to 100 foot pounds, I probably shouldn't really be torquing things at 10, 11, 12. See what I'm saying? So you, you will need more than one torque wrench right off the bat, I can tell you. And then Newton meters, that's that metric stuff. Um, but a lot of times Toyota specs are in Newton meters first. So you always wonder like, why 76 foot pounds? Like why not 80? Well, they probably used a round number in Newton meters, but then they do a direct a, a direct formula calculation from Newton meters to foot pounds. And that's the spec that a lot of times we go by. And it's kind of a weird spec. The Newton meter spec probably will make a lot more sense in Toyota. Similar with the brakes. If we had a brake rotor and it said the minimum thickness is 1.037 inches, you're like, what the heck is that? And then you look it up in millimeters and it's 25.00 millimeters. You're like, oh man, it makes sense. So if you want, you can do all of your torque in new meters. There's nothing wrong with that. But if I ask you, hey, what was the torque spec on that? Don't tell me in Newton meters. Not because foot pounds better. It's just sort of like, I know what foot pounds feels like and I know what approximate foot pounds are on general things. So if you tell me that you did 27 Newton meters on the lug nuts, I don't think that's right. But if you tell me you did 27 foot pounds on the lug nuts, I'm gonna say, no, no, pull the car back in now. That's absolutely wrong. Those are going to fall off. So I'm just more familiar personally with foot pounds. So that's how I want you to talk with me if I ask you a question. Okay. And then as we continue, this is something I really want you to understand. When we start um, torquing things, um, I'm going to grab a bolt because I've got one right here. Let's say I take, this is actually a pretty cool bolt. I bought, I bought these bolts. These are stainless steel. Um, when we thread a bolt into something, we're generally bolting two parts together. We could agree, right? So if, if let's say it's a caliper bracket to the knuckle, the steering knuckle, there's going to be a certain amount of force exerted on those parts, right? Like for example, if it's a Toyota Yaris, it's probably going to be less than let's say a Toyota Tundra right? Tundra is going to have more weight, more force, bigger tires, bigger rotors, bigger brakes, bigger stuff. I would anticipate it's probably going to have a higher torque spec on the Tundra. The bolt's probably also going to be larger, by the way. So when we start looking at the bolts, these bolts are sized for the amount of force that they're going to encounter. But additionally, when we bolt two things together, essentially what we're doing, we're attaching them. And then when we're torquing this bolt, this bolt is going to stretch a bit and it's going to clamp the parts together with a certain amount of force. Now, how much force? To be honest with you, I don't really know. That's not my skill set at all. If you asked me what size a bolt needs to be or, or how many bolts there need to be 
or how thick a bracket needs to be. Um, first off, I'm really honest with you. I'll tell you, I don't know. I don't have, I, I really don't know. But if I had to figure it out, you know what I would, I would do? I'd probably oversize everything. I would make it bigger, stronger, tougher, fast. I'd make it everything and be like, there's no way this is going to fail. You know, the problem with that, uh, if I make a car like that, it's going to be a lot more money. You're going to be like, oh yeah, yeah. I want, I want the car you designed. They're going to be like, oh, that's 300 grand. And be like, what? That's a ripoff. Well, if everything I do is oversized and overbuilt, it's expensive. So the manufacturer hires an engineer specifically to do the calculations, to determine the thickness, the size, the torque, everything. And they do the calculations based on the weight of the vehicle, the speed of the vehicle, all the magical stuff that they do. But that's what they do. That's not what I do. And that's not what you do. So if somebody's asking you, you know, what torque something is, you don't just make it up that an engineer got paid to design that an engineer got paid to do the math an engineer got paid to do all the calculations and then to come up with the torque spec. So I want you guys to really understand the torque spec of a bolt wasn't just something that somebody just made up. Okay. If you wanted me to do it, I would overbuild it and that would cost too much money. So typically the engineers are going to try to make it more simple, cheaper, you know, going to be better for mass production. If they're saving a dollar on every car and Toyota makes millions of vehicles, it's millions of dollars. Kind of see how that works out. So don't take the torque specs lightly and understand they're clamping things together. Now, here's what I want to make sure you know that. If I were to thread this bolt in just by hand and just hand tighten it, did I really stretch the bolt out? I just kind of hand tightened it over time. It's going to rattle. Right. And it's probably going to back itself out and fall out. So that's the real danger with under torquing under torquing means the bolt can rattle its way and fall out. And if it falls out, what happens? It kind of depends on what it is, right? If it's a speaker and the, and the screws fall out. Now you, you know, the speaker doesn't sound right. You get a rattle or something. Okay, fine. But if it's brakes, suspension, steering, wheels, ee, I don't know, that could be really bad. So we definitely can't leave stuff under torqued. However, that's not to say that we can over torque everything. If you're over torquing everything, you're actually more than likely damaging the bolt. So part of the reason that I bought these bolts, I was working on drive shaft. And when I went to take the drive shaft bolts out, I could not move them. They would not move. By the time I got them out, I had mangled them. And I'm pretty confident that the last person who worked on it just severely over torqued those to the point where basically the head of this bolt can only withstand so much torque. There, there, was, so much, there was so much friction and torque applied to these threads. The bolt, even with a nice, good quality snap-on or something socket, it was trying to strip the bolt out. So over torquing it, can come with some negatives and it doesn't just affect the next person to take it out. It can affect it right there on the spot. As you'll see, we'll get a little bit further into here. So there's some calculations, right? Um, this is a little bit about how we calculate the torque. Technically, if you want to calculate torque and you applied one foot pound to that ratchet, that's the blue arrow that should lift one pound if it's one foot long. So that's how you actually calculate it. Um, and then some of the origins, Newton meter was made by Isaac Newton. And basically Newton meter is another way of measuring twisting for, uh, of measuring twisting for, uh, forces, but they don't use um, foot pounds. A foot is an imperial measurement. That was like basically English. And a pound is as well. So they're going to use their things, grams um, and meters. And so next thing you know, it's Newton meters. So the Newton was 102 grams. So they've got their own version. Now let's chat about what happened here. This bolt, we're going to start actually with this bolt. This bolt is just like this bolt. 
when you thread it into something, there it is. That's it. It's still the same length. When you actually torque it, the bolt is going to stretch a little bit. If you look up here, this bolt's actually slightly longer. So it started out like this. When we torqued it, it stretched it out. That's kind of like this spring right here. The spring is elongated. That spring is constantly pulling inward, right? It's holding those parts together with its clamping force. Cool. That's what you're supposed to do. That's great. Very good job. When you torque it to spec, it acts like a spring. It holds parts together. Those don't come apart. But then if you over torque it, you see this bolt has been kind of stretched out. It's longer. I always like to reference, you have a piece of gum, you chew it nah, 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 nah. and you take it out and you grab it like this. And as you stretch it, it gets thin in the middle. That's what happened here. You notice this thin spot right here. Sometimes they'll call it like necking. That thin spot is now weak. That not only is that probably going to break when you go to loosen the bolt, but like, can you see how that is not strong? Whatever that was supposed to hold, it's been weakened. So this bolt was hand tight, that fell off and the customer died. This bolt was torqued to spec, that one didn't fall off and the customer lived. This bolt was over torqued and broke while it was being used in service like this and the customer died. That's pretty much what you have to, I mean, maybe it's a little extreme. Maybe the customer lived, I don't know, but that's how you have to look at it. There's only one bolt on this whole page that was correct. Now, if you take this bolt out, it's gonna look pretty much the same. This bolt would have fallen out and that's when it comes in missing. This bolt, you tried to get it out and either it was damaged or it ends up broken like this. See what I'm saying? So we, we gotta really get it in the, in the spec or close to the spec. Now let's talk about how, let's say we start out with a hundred foot pounds. Where does that hundred foot pounds go? So if this bolt, first off, I don't think this would withstand a hundred foot pounds. It might, but I, I can that's, that's probably going to break this bolt, but let's just say we apply a hundred foot pounds, about 45 of those foot pounds are going to where this head meets the part. So like, so like right down in there, see where my finger is that spot there's gonna be about 45 foot pounds of friction there and a hundred foot pound bolt, right? And then about 45 foot pounds are lost to these threads having friction in the part they're threading into, cool? Only about 10% of our torque spec is used to stretch it. So we got a fairly tight window. What that looks like, well, let's say um, this bolt is, rusty let's say it's rusty and you know crusty and got like dried up um maybe uh loctite or something thread locker thread locking compound you may say when we go to torque that if it's dry and rusty and we apply 100 foot pounds many many more of the foot pounds are going to overcoming the thread friction which means the bolt's not really getting stretched we're spending all of our torque wrench foot pounds on just getting the bolt to go past the dirty, nasty, rusty threads. So if we shoot hundred foot pounds, we've only provided about 4,000 pounds of clamping force. Is that adequate for the vehicle? I don't know the, the engineer designed it. I don't know. They found out how many, how many pounds of force are going to be on those parts. If we needed to have, let's say, 10,000 pounds of force and they call for 100 foot-pounds, well, if they're dry and rusty, we're only getting 4,000 pounds of clamping force. We need 10,000 pounds. That's not going to hold up, right? That's not going to provide enough clamping force. That's a bolt that's probably going to end up loose or moving around, maybe even falling out. So that's a no-go. If we're supposed to have at least 10,000, they may give a little bit of room for error. So if we're able to torque that bolt to 100 foot-pounds, that should get us up over 12,000 pounds of tension. And we only really needed 10,000, but the engineers always build in a little bit of a safety measure, right? So the difference between a dry, rusty bolt and a clean and lube bolt could be 
failure or not failure. But the technician in both instances would have used the torque wrench and hit 100 foot pounds. See how you need to know more than just get the torque wrench to do 100 foot pounds. If there's something wrong with the threads of the bolt, if they're stripped and nicked and damaged and rusty and, you know, that can cause failure. Even if you get the torque wrench out and you click it. See what I'm saying? That's important. Now you're in Southern California, so you got it pretty good. But in some rustier areas, especially east where I come from, you could take lug nuts off and they'll come off really hard because they're rusty. And then you'll put lug nuts back on and you'll click your 76 foot pounds. But most of your 76 foot pounds went to overcoming the rust. And so that may not actually be enough to really hold the wheel on. And you may find out the hard way, you know, so keep this stuff in mind. They need to be cleaned. Now, I'm not sure I would go with lubed. Sometimes the service manual calls for lubed and sometimes it doesn't. If the service manual doesn't specify lubed, then don't. Make sense? Has, does anyone know? Does the service manual specify to lubricate your wheel studs? It doesn't. I'll help you. It doesn't. It never says put anti-seize or put oil or put whatever. It doesn't say that. It, it does, it, it actually may not even say, but I'm letting you know, it's implied that they're in good condition. It will say, you know, if, there, if there's a defect on the stud, replace it, right? So if you have a big uh, bunch of thread damage on the stud, you're supposed to replace the stud. Um, but let's just say that you do glob it all up with anti-seize. What do you think the effect is? I want you guys to answer. What do you think the effect is, is of, of adding grease to the threads? I could tell you what I was told when I first had done it um, in the dealer, you know, they told me, Oh, don't, don't put any anti-seize or grease on the threads because we don't want them to fall off. And I was like, okay, greasing the threads is not going to make them fall off. It, as long as you've torqued. Now, if you grease the threads and you only hand, if you only finger tighten them, yeah, the grease is probably going to help them fall off faster. If you've hand, you know, hand, only finger tight the lug nuts. But if you torque them to spec, the grease is actually do the opposite. Remember this number back here, 45% of friction to overcome the threads. Well, if we lubricate the threads and now rather than 45 pounds being wasted to overcoming the friction on the threads, now only 25 pounds are overcoming the friction on the threads because it's greased. That would mean we're shooting an extra 20 pounds to stretch. We're actually over torquing the lug nuts if we grease them and torque them to the same spec. You might have to think about that for a little bit, but it's the truth. Make sense? So we could be over torquing the lug nuts just by greasing them, period. Okay, so we'll continue. Now let's talk about the phases. I want you for the rest of the semester when we're tightening things, I want you to remember what all is happening. The rundown phase, the first one, that's basically like, you know, when you hand start a bolt and it's loose and you can easily spin it, that's the rundown phase. We're just basically running it down. That should be very easy. For the record, actually, that's a perfect time to use a faster tool. So like, let's say you're old school, you want to use a speed wrench. You can spin the speed wrench. Say you're new school. How are you going to spin that bolt down faster? The, gun. the impact. Yeah. Right. And so now you guys are graduating to my class. You're allowed to use power tools now. Congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. However, with great power comes great responsibility. You take that impact and you start busting stuff off. You're on the hook for it. Make sense? So I want to just help you to understand the impact is amazing for the rundown phase. So if you run the impact, I'll even grab mine right now. All right. All right. So if I run the impact and you can hear it, if it's making that noise, that's just the rundown phase. What noise does it make as soon as the bolt starts to get tight? Uh, it's the clicking sound from exactly. the hammer smacking. Exactly. So I'll, I'll, I'll replicate. Ready? Run down. And then as soon as you start to hear that, 
that is when we've passed the rundown phase and we're into the alignment phase. That's when basically it's aligning our parts. It's, it's starting. It's not necessarily torquing yet, but it's like starting to get stuff so it's tight. So if let's say you were super ultra flat rado, flat rado style, you could actually take this one. This one's got a, a lower setting. I could put on the lower setting. Oh, that wasn't low. Okay, now I got one. Well, that still feels pretty strong, right? So you can actually turn the gun on basically stun so that way you don't get yourself in trouble. That's probably what I'd recommend, especially starting out. The rundown in the alignment phase, great. The, the gun's great for that. However, the next phase here, the elastic phase is while we're actually stretching this bolt out. As great as the gun was for, for rundown, and probably most of the alignment phase, um, that's a strength for the gun. Its weakness is when you go in the elastic phase, this gun won't be like, hey, stop, like, slow down, wait a minute. It's just gonna be like, rah, 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 rah. it's just gonna, it'll go right past this elastic phase if you don't know what you're doing. And that is why when you're brand new, we make you do everything by hand. Once you get the feel, so if you think of the feeling, right, you're, you're threading the lug nut down. It's so easy. It's taking forever. And then it's like, okay, it's starting to snug up. Finger tight. All right, cool. You felt that stage. And then when you're torquing it, you'll feel the torquing get like tighter, 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 click. Boom. You felt all three of the phases. The gun, if you, if you get some experience with the gun, you can hear the phases. You can hear a rundown, click, 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 is starting to do alignment. And then the elastic phase, that's the one where, you know, the gun doesn't really give any feedback on that. So when you get into this elastic phase, this is when we should change over the torque wrench. So I want to give you a, a little breakdown. Slope of the torque angle curve is constant. The fastener is elongated, but will return to its original length upon loosening. That's elastic, right? Y'all put on underwear, I'd expect, and more than likely, it had elastic in it, right? You stretch the elastic, it can get bigger, and then you let it go and it gets smaller. And then tomorrow, it does the same thing, and next week it does the same thing, and next year it does the same thing, right? Elastic means it can go shh, shh. The bolt should be able to stretch a little and come back. That's the elastic phase. Now, you, of course, with the gun, still going to send it, you know, you're going to go right past that and into the plastic or yield that's over torqued. That means it's, it's no longer going to spread out like, like elastic and come back to its shape. It's going to spread out and that's it. It doesn't come back. See, so that would be over torqued, permanent deforming, permanent deformation and elongation. And so we're pretty much ruining it at that point. Make sense? That's when the bolt is damaged. And remember, we talked about it. If it's aluminum, the bolt's probably not gonna be damaged. The aluminum is gonna be damaged. So if that bolt is threaded into a caliper, like for example, a brake flex hose, you just damage the caliper, that could be expensive. If it's the, if it's the um, brake lines or the uh, power steering lines going into a power steering rack, that could be expensive the racks of aluminum, et cetera. So watch these. Now let's run through the torque. Rundown phase, remember? Or alignment phase starts to get a little tight. We start to get a little, just the first couple clicks. Boom, we're in the alignment phase. Elastic phase, what I wanna point out here, if you look, this was like really the same, the same, the same, the same, the same, start to get tougher. And then right here, this is like a constant increase. See how that's really like a constant slope. When you're torquing, you'll notice it gets tighter, 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 tighter. Have you ever gone too far? What's it feel like? It doesn't keep getting more and more difficult. You ever notice it? It gets really hard and then it snaps and then it's forever loose. <laughs> oh, that's when righty tighty becomes righty loosey. That's how you know you screwed up. So if you look, 
it's tighter, 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 tighter. And then it's yielding. Yielding is when it's starting to basically feel like it's letting go. Yielding is when you've damaged it, right? So spinning it down, starting to get hard, torquing it somewhere into this range, nice and steady. And then you hear your click and then you're done. And if you overshoot it, that's in the yield. Now, part of the reason that this is such an amazing chart is who's heard of torque to yield bolts? Torque to yield. Head studs for the yeah. uh, engine. Sure, and some other engine parts too. So um, let me help you to understand what's happening here. Torque to yield bolts are permanently going past the elastic phase and into the yield phase. And there's a reason for that. So let's say like in this case, um, these are actually studs. And so if we're starting with cylinder number, we're starting with um, bolt number one in the center of the head, we're going to actually torque it 27 to 32 foot pounds, then turn it an additional, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this more simple. Torque at 30 foot pounds, turn it an additional 90 degrees, loosen it one turn, that's 365, torque at 30 foot pounds, turn an additional 90, and then turn an additional 90, but not all on that one bolt. You're going to go like this, one torque it to 30, two, torque it to 30, three, torque it to 30, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, torque them all to 30. And then one, go an additional 90, two, go an additional 90, three, go an additional 90, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, additional 90. Then all of them back them all off one turn and then back to one, 30 foot pounds, two, 30 foot pounds, three, 30 foot pounds. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then back to one, 90 degrees, two, 90 degrees, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then one again, another 90. That's kind of weird. That's going to take forever. Do you know why we use foot pounds and then we change over to degrees? Think about that for a second. It's kind of weird. What? Wouldn't the foot pounds put us in that uh, elastic phase and then the 90 degrees put us in the yield phase? True. And see what the reason why is if you look at this chart, when you're in the elastic phase, torquing with foot pounds is amazing. But once you get into the yield phase, you're probably no longer going to really be able to hit your torque number because it actually starts to get looser. You're stretching that bolt. It's probably not going to make your torque wrench click. And even if it is, it's not going to be real consistent. So it's actually more accurate to measure the yield phase in degrees of rotation. So one degree of rotation or, or, or 90 degrees or 360 degrees, those are all going to make, those are all going to be more accurate in measuring clamping force once we get into the red yield phase. So any bolt any bolt that starts talking about tightening an additional degrees, 90 degrees, 30 degrees, 60, whatever it is, that's how you know that's a torque to yield bolt. They don't work like normal bolts. They're designed to stretch and the part that you're stretching is designed to have those particular bolts. Now, what do you think the negative of torque to yield bolts is? They're one time Single use, use only. Exactly. So I want you really to know. Now, I didn't I didn't always go real crazy on torque to yield with brakes. I really usually save this for engines. However, I did some work on a Ford Transit van recently, and that has torque to yield brake bolts. So when I went to get the brake kit, I did a little bit more research, right? Because, you know, if it's the first time I've ever done a job, I'm going to refer to service info. And sure enough, I logged into all data and I looked and it said all these bolts are torque to yield. And so when I called oh oh O'Reilly's, you know, that wasn't, I'm not freezing up. I'm just I'm imitating the commercial. They said, oh, do you want the bolt kit? And I was like, matter of fact, yes, I do. And they actually sell you the pads, the rotors, and the torque to yield bolts for a brake job. So you need to know this to do even just to do brakes. That's how, that's where we're at in, in this world that I don't understand. All right, so that should really make a lot of sense to everybody. Um, to maximize torque, you're going to want to minimize your friction, right? Daniel, go ahead. I see your hand. Shoot it. Yeah, um, I've just been wondering this because it's something that I'm encountering, um, that like torque to yield bolts, 
they can be reused, but they have to be measured within a certain range, right? Yeah, so like in in terms of length, right? <clears throat> kind of. I'm going to I'm going to give you the short answer and then I'm going to give you the in detailed explanation for that during engines, but I will give you my short answer today is it all depends on what the manufacturer says. So if the manufacturer says one time use, you trash them. However, Toyota is very notorious for measure the bolts, don't necessarily condemn them. But what but what Toyota will do, I kind of doubt I might actually have, I don't think I have any tortilla bolts right here in my toolbox, but I can I can give you like a, a visual. This bolt would be a certain amount of length. Let's say this bolt is um, 200 millimeters. Torque to yield bolt that's over torqued would be 220 millimeters. But as long as it's like 200 to 219, maybe it's good. But the thing is, they never really have you measure the length. What they actually have you do, they have you measure the cross section. So if this bolt has gotten stretched, what's happened to my cross section? Spinned out. Exactly. So they're generally having you measure here. And that's accurate, actually. If you think about it, that that's actually a great method. I prefer that. Remember, I was originally trained as a as a GM guy. They were like, one time use, throw them in the trash. Yeah. And then I came over to Toyota land and I was like, yeah, one time use. And then I actually read the manual myself. And I was like, oh crap. They actually want us to measure those as a cross section. And if it's if it's under an amount, then they're junk. And if it's over an amount, then you're actually okay to clean them up and reuse them. So it, my answer is follow the service information. It can vary one job to the next. Okay. And we will do that more detail next semester. So you guys kind of understand this. If you minimize your friction, you'll maximize the actual amount of stretch, but the opposite is true. If you have too much friction on the threads, you're not going to get the correct amount of stretch. So I was even looking to see if I might have any uh, thread lock bolts. Like this one's kind of got some, some leftover goop on it and stuff. That's going to actually add to my friction. This bolt, what I should really do, I should take a wire brush and clean this bolt extensively before I actually reuse it. And then if you guys use Loctite, you know, you want to clean before you apply the Loctite, if it calls for Loctite. If it doesn't call for Loctite, I wouldn't use Loctite. And that's really, again, the summary is basically follow the procedures that the service manual calls for, especially in your case, because, um, you know, this is, we're in a legalistic society. So people are looking to sue, to, um, you know, to pass off the blame, right? So, so let's say that um, you do a job and then something goes wrong with that job. There's probably somebody after you who's going to be looking for anything you've done wrong to kind of blame you. So, so while a lot of times I agree, Loctite would be a good, a good idea. Um, I would only really follow the service manual because if you ever get your butt hauled into court, I want you to think about what you're going to say. If the prosecutor is saying, um, let's say I'll pick on Mitchell because he's like second on my screen. Uh, Mitchell, on or about, um, let's say, what, what the heck day is it? I don't know, January 30th. On or about January 30th, did you work on customer Toyota such and such and not apply Loctite? And you'd say, um uh, yeah, I didn't apply Loctite. And they'd say, and why did you not apply Loctite? Because on service manual document number 727.85, it specifies to use Loctite and torque it to spec. And you'd be like, well, uh, the guy next to me said not to worry about it. Uh, and I thought and what I felt and see like, so while I agree, by the time you all get some experience, you're going to be extremely valuable. The court doesn't really care. The court is like basically, basically your service manual becomes the gospel truth. There's no debating it. There's no, in court, you can't even, you can't even be like, well, I think what the service manual was trying to say was like, use Loctite if you're worried about it. Like, no, there's no, it just is what it is. So you're all going to be at some point, You'll all be to the point where you're line tech and you can do stuff how you want to do stuff. I do stuff how I want to do stuff too. 
Sometimes I'll follow it exactly and sometimes I won't. But if I don't and something goes wrong, I'm not going to feel like, you know, it's not my fault. It is my fault. If I do anything other than exactly what the service manual says, it's my fault. And I'll take that because I'm probably going to shortcut the manual and make a little bit extra money. And once in a while, if it bites me, I'm still going to have made some extra money and save some time. And, and of course, I mean, it would totally rock my world if somebody actually got hurt, but generally my stuff's turn out fine. That just wouldn't hold up in court. Y'all understand. All yeah. right. So as we continue, um, it does talk a little bit about torque sequences. So you guys should be familiar. That's why we're torquing lug nuts and a star pattern, different types of torque wrenches. Um, you need to hand, you need to hold these on the grip, by the way, if you're, if you're choking up on it, like, a, like, like you're playing baseball, you can't, it's not going to read correctly. You need to be somewhere down here. Right. And as we're doing it, um, approach the final torque slowly and evenly. I see people sometimes going super fast as they're hitting those torque numbers. If you're going too fast, you're overshooting it. I can tell you already. So just slow it down. And another note, the sweet spot is typically between 30 and 80%. So let's just say that this was a um, zero to a hundred, which it's not, but let's say it was. This torque wrench is gonna be most accurate between 30 foot pounds and 80 foot pounds. If you're using a hundred foot pound torque wrench to torque a hundred foot pounds, I don't really know. You'd be better off probably using a 50 to 250 to hit a hundred. That'd be more like in its range. Um, so just FYI. It's a little less critical on a digital, but um, even still, you'd kind of like it to be a little more towards the center if possible. Okay. And then again, you like if they're giving you specs in Newton meters, you should use a torque wrench that says Newton meters. Um, a lot of mine, for example, they say Newton meters on one side and foot pounds on the other side. But uh, worst case, if you want, if, you're, if your torque wrench only does foot pounds and your spec is only in Newton meters, you can Google that real quick. 85 Newton meters to foot pounds, write it down and then use your foot pound torque wrench. You can do that. Um, a quick plug for, uh, and by the way, it should be calibrated periodically, but also if it's dropped. If you drop it, that's, that's good reason to actually send it out and have it checked for accuracy. Um, that's why mine's in a case. When we're done, I put mine back in the case. Mine's never been dropped, ever, never, ever. Um, so this kind of talks about the click type. Like I said, it's 20 to 100% of full scale, but the sweet spot is more like 30 to 80. Should be checked regularly. Now, should never be used in a breakaway situation. What the heck is that? What the? Using it to loosen. Yeah, that's not what they're made for. Don't do that. You, if it's your tool and you want to do it, sure. But we just talked about having to get it calibrated and checked. Why in the world would you use it as a breaker bar? Breaker bars don't need to be calibrated and checked. Use the breaker bar. Okay. And then when you store it, what's it say? At its lowest setting. Now, I had a debate with a guy. It's going a ways back. I won't even take it back out and show you. This guy said at its lowest setting, if it's a 20 to 100, that means store it at 20. And I was like kind of like no it just means turn it down it even if you turn it below 20 just turn it down all the way and put it back in the case and we had quite an quite an argument but i'm very confident i'm right um i'm not always right and i certainly don't know everything but if i'm pretty sure i'm right i'm probably going to be right the general reason that we turn these down is as you turn it up you're putting more and more tension on a spring and the spring is what initiates the click and take like, let's say springs on a car, for example, over time they wear and the heavier the car is, the faster they're going to wear. And if you put a whole bunch of weight in a car and you smush it and you leave it smushed for a year, and then you come back and take the weight out, the car's probably going to sit lower, right? So I like to take all the tension, all the tension off the torque wrench and then store it. And then periodically, you know, I'll have it checked and, and my torque wrench has stayed right on the money for years. I never leave it turned all the way up. I never leave it turned up at all. I just undo it all the way, not even to the, to the, to the lowest number. I take it all the way to the lowest setting, which is full counterclockwise. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. So compare that. And when they say, they say cycle, which should be like 
sometimes what they'll actually want you to do is like tighten it, loosen it, and then set it. Um, and then don't use it in its capacity, uh, excess of its capacity. And then one positive of one of these, you don't have to turn the beam type up and down. You can just leave it. Like you can leave it in your toolbox. You don't have to loosen it all the way. So that's kind of an advantage of this type. Um, but you know, they're hard. Like you got to get down eye level to see them. If you're torquing wheels, I probably would say no. We will use these in uh, differentials later, but they're accurate 20 to 100%. Um, same things, approach slowly and evenly, same, same types of things. These, however, can't be calibrated. So if it's older and it's out of calibration, you're just done. You just got to replace it. Now the digital, and, and of course, you know, Snap-on would like to make a plug for their digital. Anybody know what these cost right here? Let's say this was, let's go with the big boy, a half inch digital. $3,000 in your left kidney. Okay. That must <laughs> it's like 950 bucks. We saw it today at the truck. 950. Yeah. That's there was one time at the truck and that was a deal. Uh, that was the deal, was it? No, it was two thousand for the big one half one, and then the three eighths and the one fourth. Oh, the two thousand for all three of them. Yeah. So did you write the check or what? Hell no. No, uh, that's a thought. I mean, he, he gives you the credit. Why not, right? I don't know. Uh, because it still costs you the same amount of money. <laughs> it feels better though when it's twenty dollars a week for the rest of your life till you die, doesn't it? Dude, the mm. discount's cheaper. Nah, Take out sure. against my house. Well, and that's the thing. You guys got to weigh out what is going to be the actual best deal for you. And, and I'm not sure I have all the answers. I do have a digital right here. Um, it's not a snap-on. Matter of fact, I do have a snap-on, but this is old school. So I'll tell you a little bit about this one. I bought this one and I justified this one because if I buy one digital, this digital can do foot pounds, it could do inch pounds, it could do Newton meters, and its range went low enough where I could use it as a quarter inch and I could use it as a three eighths. So this is a three eighths, but if I put an adapter, I could use it as a quarter inch for inch pounds. So if I needed a three eighths and a quarter inch, I need two torque wrenches and it was actually cheaper to buy one digital than two mechanicals. That's why I bought this. Now, I actually regret it. Do you know why I regret buying this? Every time I go to use it, because I don't use it really all that often, every time I go to use it, look what I find. Corrosion and dead batteries, like every time. So it's kind of a hassle. So I'll clean it all up, I'll get it working. This thing just eats batteries. The batteries are always dead on this. So if you're going to use a torque wrench daily, the digital would probably be pretty cool. If you're going to use a torque wrench periodically, it ends up being a little bit of a hassle, in my opinion. Um, the positive is when I, if I set this to 27 foot pounds and I do a drain plug, I just set it down and I'm done. I don't have to turn it down. I don't have to readjust it. And then next time I turn it on, boom, I turn it on, it's already at 27 foot pounds. I'm good to go. So that's a real positive. Um, but I don't know. Looking back, I, I, I probably don't like entirely regret it, but there was one issue. You see how this one's red? This is just your digital torque wrench. Shortly after this, they came out with a gray one. I'll put this one away later. They came out with a gray one, and that one can measure angle. So we were talking about torque to yield. If I have torque to yield, I need to be able to do foot pounds, and then additional degrees. The red one can't do that. The gray one that came out a month later could do that. And of course, I told the guy in the truck, hey, yeah, I got this on student discount. Can I trade it into the gray one that does that does uh, torque angle? And he's like, yeah, but I'm I'm gonna he offered me like a really low price. And so I I was I've kind of been stuck with it. So now at this point. I would say the digital is justifiable because they do torque angle. Anything torque to yield is going to use torque angle. The digitals do that now. So if you guys see on the snap on site, they call it uh, tech angle. Have you guys seen that? 
tech angle is the one that you really want. If it doesn't do angle, I wouldn't go with that one. Um, the Mac one is actually the schools. I have it here. That one also does angle, but let me see. Nice big case. That one does angle as well, but it's probably not quite as nice as the Snap-on. So if you see the Mac one and it has this symbol here, this actually does angle. So like if I turn it on, um, let me make sure I'm gonna have it right side up here. So you guys can see that was at 27 foot pounds. If I press the uh, unit button, you know, cycle through the, okay, there we go, 70. So when I go to actually do the torque angle, it's gotta calibrate for a second. And then once it'll calibrate for a second, it'll come up with a zero. And then as I turn it, that will go up to the setting. So let's say it calls for 90. You know how much 90 is? 90 would be from here to here. But sometimes it calls for something weird. I'm messing it up because I'm moving it around. Sometimes it calls for 70. And sometimes Toyota will say like, make a, make a dot and then measure 70 degrees and make another dot and then turn it till the dots line up. It's just much more manageable with a digital torque wrench that can do tech angle or, or some sort of a torque angle, then they call it something different. So I would consider it. I don't like see for this one, for example, I have on 70. I don't remember. I do remember this was for a camshaft. It saves its last setting. So if I do a 70 foot, if I do a 70 measurement, um, let's see if I can get it to actually start. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, so you'll see it'll change in degrees as I do it. Well, it's tough to fake it out, but this will actually measure the degrees. And you could do it in multiple steps, right? You could tighten some and then ratchet it and tighten more and it'll actually save how many degrees you've done total. So the digitals are really cool, but the price is, the price is rough. So I'm not sure I'd recommend you buy a digital right away but eventually you'll probably want something that can do angle because a lot of times with engine stuff, they're calling for angle and sometimes even with other stuff. So consider those. Um, but, and the newer ones, the batteries last way longer. That original snap on one, that thing was batteries were just always getting burned up. The other problem, never exposed to moisture. So is anybody thinking about being like doing some uh, side work, mobile mechanic side work? Huh? Huh? Nobody, somebody. Um, well, if you got your digital torque wrench and you're doing some side work and it starts to sprinkle, you know, there's that, you guys told me 900 bucks. I don't know. That's a little risky. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think I would bring a digital torque wrench outside the shop. I don't think I'd even bring it outside. A little scary to me. Um, so very good. Done with snap on back onto the back onto the introduction, which is um, of the course as a whole. So as a reminder, every bolt on the car has a torque spec somewhere. It's very hard to find all the torque specs. I mean, everything like let's even say you guys doing lube tech work, you have to pull the plastic sh skid plates down sometimes. Those torque, those bolts have a torque spec. Where it is, I don't know. Even some things, you'll never find the torque spec, but on some manuals, it'll say, if it's a bolt, like this bolt right here is an M10 by 125. It will even say if it's an M10 by 125, torque it to 42 foot pounds or something. It won't even say the drive shaft bolt. It'll say any bolt that's an M10 by one by 1.25. Or for example, um, every bolt that's an M6 by 1.0, that's not specified due to this spec. You see what I'm saying? So there is a torque spec somewhere for every bolt. But like I'm admitting right here, finding the torque spec can be difficult, but for brakes, steering suspension, it's a safety issue. So for things like that, you need to find it. If it's the skid plates on the, on the Tacoma, you're probably going to hit those with the German torque spec. You know about German torque specs, don't you? Good and tight, huh? Mm-hmm. You don't want to come up with any new ones? Close enough. I mean, those types of things. If it fits, it ships. We have these, we have these terms that we use. So 
like for something like that, it's not super critical. We're probably just going to snug that up and run it. Brakes, steering, suspension, get the torque specs. Okay. And then um, we're going to do a demo on actually um, doing this work tomorrow. So we're going to, we're going to have some cars in and then we're going to actually find some torque specs specifically. Um, in fact, you know what, we could, we could take a second. We'll switch it up a little bit. Um, you guys commonly are using TIS. So this should be pretty familiar to you. I'm going to pull um, TIS right from off screen here. Alrighty. Let me get this thing where I'm about to get logged in. And then we'll pick what we've been, what we're going to work on right now. So I'll just give you like a couple quick examples. Um, Cause you might be a little bit rusty as to how we find torque specs. Okay. What do you want to work on today? Mi amigos. It's going to be a Toyota. Taco. 2005 Taco. Oh, I see what you want to work on. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll do that. So on some of the older ones, they can be a little bit tougher to find specs. Not that I'm calling it old, old Clifford, but uh, it can be a little bit tough. Let's just say even we'll go with lug nuts. Sometimes we'll call it wheel nuts or studs. So if I search uh, wheel nuts, I guess I could zoom in for you. Um, and we just go into repair manual directly. Let's see. Um, hmm. Not seeing a whole lot. They can be a little tough. How would you guys find it? Wheel nut, maybe? Or would you just browse? Or did you already memorize it? <laughs> Wheel nut would work. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Hmm. This seems vaguely familiar. And it just talks about kind of general maintenance, but you guys will notice on some of these older ones, it's literally like pages out of the service manual. So that can be a little tough. Um, how about, hmm. What I used to do is to to put wheel torque specs, like oh, yeah? yeah, right, D O S P, yeah, that's it. Okay, well, for example, we got definitely some brake stuff, um, but see what's interesting is it may not find it as well on an 05. Now, if we were looking at 2015, I feel like we most likely would have found it by now, but we did find something here. This is more for brake parts. Front wheel, 113 Newton meters, 83 foot pounds. So it may, you may have to go through several pages. Uh, I know it's tempting to just give up and be like, whatever, just run it. But on this stuff, I really want you guys to take the time. For example, even like the bleeder, eight foot pounds. Um, that might be one of the ones where you have to really translate over to inch pounds and come up with uh, whatever our number was. Um, whatever the number is in inch pounds. Let's go with, um, let's just say, disc brake caliper mounting X steering knuckle. What do you think that is? Hmm. That's the caliper, particularly the mounting bracket to the steering knuckle. So it's where the it's where the they're probably going to be like seventeen millimeter bolts going through the caliper bracket to the knuckle. That's going to be a pretty big high high torque spec, eighty foot pounds. Now that's drastically different than let's just say um, let's go with. Um, Let's see what we got for caliper. Anything with a caliper. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a different spec for the caliper. And I'm sure it's here, but I'm definitely struggling to find it. Let's see if a control F will find it. 
<laughs> so sometimes you need to know the terms if you're going to find the torque specs. Okay, that looks like it's a no. Um, so let's jump out of. It was fun looking up at 05, but it's kind of a it's kind of tough on the older ones. Let's say we jump into a 20. We can go even newer if you want 2020 search. And in fact, we'll get away from uh, the torque spec, but there you go, tire and, tire and wheel torque specs, first thing that pops up. Oops, I accidentally clicked off that. All right, tire pressure warning. Tire pre it's So this is TPMS sensors in the front rear wheel. Do you guys see how much easier it's gotten in the newer vehicles? It used to be a lot tougher back in the day because they were literally... They were literally making the service manual in print and then uploading it as a PDF to TIS. Now it's more like it's pretty much made as an online service manual. So it's just much easier to navigate. Now let's go with um, some brake things since that's what we're going to be doing. We'll just simply search uh, disc brake or we might, might even search front brake. Um, and let's say that we're doing uh, a brake job. You're most likely just going to want to reference assembly. Now this is talking about rebuilding a caliper, replacing seals, which you could do. Um, and we actually, I do have this assembly grease, uh, if you assembly lube, if you ever want to do one, which is usually towards week about five, I think about week five, we can do those. Um, so this was just reassembling the caliper. So that was a no, that was not the right thing for me to pick. How about installation? You better, you knock it off, you. Okay, let's try this one more time. No idea what happened there. Okay, so look, it talks about making a mark on the rotor, inspecting the runout, which we're gonna do by the way. Install the disc brake cylinder assembly. That is the caliper. That's kind of a weird description for a caliper, but it does talk about the torque for those 91 foot pounds and then using a union nut wrench, that's for the brake line. So you you have to be able to, you have to be able to kind of understand. Sometimes they'll show you a picture. Sometimes pictures are nice. But a lot of times they 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 may not. Um, let's say we go down here. It just talks about the the grease points. Um, you know, and and this one's kind of unique. So so the uh, the Tacoma was an interesting one to pick, but basically it did give us our torque spec of ninety one foot pounds. Let's jump on to uh, another one. Let's go with a more basic like a Camry. I think the Camry will help you understand a little bit better. And a lot of times there's different ways to find it as well, by the way. So let's jump to, or we could do your favorite, a Prius. Okay, we'll search for that. Okay, there's removal, most there's rear, let's stay on front installation of the pads will most likely be good. And so you'll you'll find this will most likely be a little different. No, I don't want the I don't want the oh really sure production date we gotta give it the production date. Huh I wonder TRS being a little funny. I wonder what the deal is there. I picked that. It's really strange. Pick the production date of the early production date. Okay, yeah, I guess I just had to click more info. Don't remember having to do that. So it talks about doing the installation and 
hold the front disc brake cylinder slide pin lower side and install look at that 25 foot pounds that's very different so in on one they were actually talking about the caliper bracket to the knuckle that would be more like 80 this is actually talking about the caliper to the caliper bracket that would more be like 25 you have to make sure you understand exactly what you're looking at because they can be it can be it can be a little bit hard sometimes to know exactly what they're saying and so you know these are a couple different ways to find some torque specs like i said once in a while they'll give you uh, a picture and that's actually really nice i was going to see if we could see that one front brake pad i don't we could look at components possibly Eventually, sure, we'll keep it with early. Go to components. All right, seriously. Okay, that's nicer. See, the picture is telling you 25. By the way, remember, this is uh, Newton meters and then kilogram feet or something, and then foot pounds. So the third number was foot pounds. The key to that is somewhere. Actually, I don't really see the key. So you, you do have to know a little bit. 25 foot pounds would be good. Okay, cool. So there's a little bit of a demo. You guys will have to do quite a bit more practice. If you come to me and you say, where is it? Where it is depends on what year it is. So I may not have the immediate answer. You're going to have to put a little bit of time to really master the ability to do that. But I believe in you. So we will continue. You guys could see all those pretty good, right? Good. Okay, so now we're going to get into how service flows. This isn't really this isn't really about brakes. This is just about service in general, and uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover. So this is how I do stuff. It's a little bit of a different difference for you for last semester. Part of the positive is you'll have the recording. So if you're like, oh, I had to go to the bathroom and I missed three minutes, well, watch the recording. So the flow overall, if you get the car. We need to gather as much information as we can. Part of that is the service advisor. The service advisor gets to talk with the customer. If it's a good service advisor, they'll ask good questions. If it's a not a good service advisor, which I don't know if those exist, they might not ask any of the good questions at all. It might be totally worthless, the information they gave us. But we do need to gather as much information as we can. Um, and then we really need to verify that customer concern. You have to. And we're going we're gonna to cover each of these again. Then we need to research the possible causes. Then we need to perform tests. Then we need to carry out repairs. Then we need to re verify repairs. This is how it works. You have to be ready to do it like this. If you don't do it like this, you're going to be opening yourself up to more problems and nobody needs more problems. And if you need more problems, make yourself more problems. Don't give other people more problems. I need no more problems. Okay. So if you do it like this, let's just say, um, get all the information from the customer about what the noise is. Let's say their concerns and noise, all the information. When does it make the noise? What do you have to do to make the noise? Reproduce the noise. Is it like this? Or is it like this? Ooh, or is it like this? Tuka, 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 tuka. You know, get them to give you all the information you can. And sometimes maybe even a little extra. Like, can, can you also tell, can you imitate animal sounds? You know, ask them things that are not relevant just for fun. Okay. Like, what does the fox say? I'm not exactly sure, but maybe they know. Right. So, but really, get all the information you can. And then, if you know it's supposed to make a noise that goes like this, you're gonna how are you gonna verify that like that? How are you gonna verify that? Hmm. Hmm. You gonna talk to the car? What are you gonna do? You ask it how its day was? Turn it on and hear that song. Turn it on. You might have to drive it. You might see this is where we want to get the good information. If the customer says it goes eat. Then you say, well, when? Is it when you start it or is it when you drive it? 
or is it when you turn left or is it when you turn right? Or is it when you're braking or when you're accelerating, right? Because we want to know. Sometimes cars make more than one noise. And sometimes the customer comes in for a noise they have in their mind. And if you hear a different noise, you're chasing the wrong noise. So we need to get all the information. Then we need to duplicate it. So there's a lot of potential issues. If we start to try to make repairs on a problem that we haven't duplicated, that's really bad. That's a good way to get the car bought back by Lemon Law because if you try to make a repair, that means you're you're acknowledging there's a problem. And if there's nothing wrong, there was nothing you could fix, that means the car is now unfixable and it's going to be Lemon Law buyback. And that costs everybody. I mean, all the manufacturers, but we'll say in this case, Toyota, that cost Toyota a lot of money. And it was not because it was a bad car. It was because we tried to fix something that wasn't broken. Okay. So it's critical that we verify the concern. And then let's say like, let's say we did verify the noise and it was a squeak. It was a, remember what could cause it. Then we might have to do some research. Maybe we have to do some technical service bulletin search. Maybe we have to just think about it. A lot of times if I get a car I'm relying on my own knowledge and experience and I'm going to research what that could be, which might just mean thinking about like, what the heck would make it go ee, 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 only when I go left? Well, maybe the squealer on the brake pads touching because the brakes are low, right? That could be, is that possible? Then it's a possible cause. What do I do after the possible cause? Let's pick the brake. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform a test and my test in this case is just really going to be pull the wheel off and look at it, you know, but that's just an example for brakes, right? Overall, it has to flow this way. And if I inspect it and the brakes are low, what am I going to do? Hmm. Recommend replacing the brakes and resurfacing. the them. Yeah. And if they, if the customer buys it, then I'm going to fix it. Then I'm going to replace the brakes, re replace the pads, resurface the rotors, new rotors, whatever it needed. Right. Then after I'm done, what do I need to do? Verify the thing that you did, like solve the problem. Yeah. So I'm going to go for another drive and I say, ah, it used to go. And now it doesn't go. It just goes. Then I know it's good. Nobody's going to come back to me. The car's not going to haunt me. You know, the car, they're not going to say I didn't do a good job. Like, I'm just going to do the job good. And if you do every car like that, you're going to fix problems for people. So you're giving them a good service. But also, the dealer is going to make money and you're going to make money. And, you know, that's kind of how you move your way up. And that's how you build a good reputation for yourself. So part of the reason I like this job is we do help people. Um, this job is not just you know, a way to make money for me. I, I like to solve problems, only problems that are solvable. I don't solve people problems. If somebody has mental issues, I'm out. I can tell you right now. Nope, because now I'm dealing with free will. Some people don't want to get well, but generally speaking, the car doesn't care either way. So if I'm good at my job, I can fix the car. Not only can I fix the car, I can verify that I fixed the car and I can feel good about it. So I do like it because we get to help people but we don't do it necessarily out of charity. I mean, you know, the ox that goes around the mill and grinds the grain might get a little bit hungry. So if the ox wants to eat a little bit of a grain, the grain, the ox should be able to eat a little bit of the grain. You don't muzzle the ox. So nobody, nobody who's ethical is going to ask you to fix their car for free. They're going to expect you have to make some money. You have to pay your bills. If you're the ox and you're hungry, you have to eat some grain. But you shouldn't be charging a whole bunch. You're, this is not a get rich quick thing. Like if you want to get rich, you're, you're not going to get rich fixing cars. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but I can tell you firsthand. You're never going to hit it big. You're never going to be like, oh, I make tons of money for very little work. Because our job is to fix people's cars. Our job is to help them. That takes work. Okay. So if you do it like this, you're helping people, you're fixing the car, you're getting a good reputation and you're going to get paid. You might not get paid as much as you think you're worth, but eventually the money really does, the, the money really does follow. And 
there's a lot of opportunities. And so if, if you're at one place and they, you know, are really underpaying you, either A, you're not as good as you think and you think you're worth more and you're not. That's very possible, by the way. Or B, they're underpaying you and another place will pay you more and you can go get it. You just go get it. It's the free market. The free market worth, works both ways. And so that's how you have to look at it. That's our job. That's what we do. So now if you were talking to the customer, like under what circumstances does the concern occur or not occur? So if it was that noise, right? How Basically, how can I duplicate the noise so I know I'm chasing the right noise? How long has it been occurring? You know, so let's say the reason I might ask that is if they tell me they have this noise and then I say, well, you know, did something initiate it? Oh yeah, it was ever since I had my brakes done. Now I'm looking at the problem very different. If the noise was fine and then they had their brakes done and now it makes the noise, it's something that happened when their brakes were done. Now, maybe someone bent the metal backing plate. That's possible. When you're doing brakes, you're right next to it. Or maybe they took those nice Toyota OEM ceramic pads and they slapped on some El Cheapo, Vato Zone, you know, semi-metallics. And, and at which case, you're not going to necessarily find something wrong. You can be like, the brake pads are thick. The brake pads are like new. Yeah, but they're not ceramic anymore. And see, the only reason you might have caught onto that is because they said there was no noise. And then there was a noise and you asked what changed. And they said they had their brakes done. See how you could be doing like some detective work. You're trying to figure out the problem, right? Any smells, any sounds. Did you have any recent work done, service or accessories? What other recent changes, right? It's, and this is the problem too. I don't have the solutions, by the way. Some, some, I can give you advice, but I don't always have the world solutions. In fact, I pretty much never do. Sometimes customers are going to lie. Like sometimes when you're probing them to try to find out to help your diagnosis, they think if they tell you that they had work done somewhere else that you're going to raise their price. So it's very difficult at times to get the customer to give you information that's going to help you help them. Because for some reason, they just have like, they're a little cuckoo sometimes. It's like, oh no, I don't want them to know that I had you know, the guy on the corner changed my brakes because they're going to double my price. Maybe some price, places would, but I, I wouldn't change the price. I just want to figure it out quicker, right? And then are there any other related things, like any other systems that may not be operating correctly? Like if there's another issue, they may, knowing that there's a problem with this may help you find out the root problem of that. See what I'm saying? So just gathering information. Basically, the whole summary of asking these questions is so the customer understands, help me help you by duplicating the issue. If the customer says, I don't know what the noise is, it's just a noise. And then you say, well, when does it do it? And they say, well, I don't really know when it does it. It just does it. And then you say, well, will it do it right now? And they say, I don't really know. I, To be honest, if that was my customer, I'd say, uh, I'm sorry, if that's all you've got, no, I don't really need you as a customer. Like, no. Just no, they've got to at least try to help us help them. Make sense? All right, so speaking of strategy-based diagno diagnosis, who thinks they understand this kind of? Because you guys have done some pretty good diagnosis work. I saw you in electrical, very nice. Um, I'm going to give you my, my little spin on it. Proper diagnosis is important. Misdiagnosis is a horrible thing. Um, but addition to that, look at this, that's the purpose of the state and federal law, the state and federal laws come out to protect the consumer. So not only is it horrible and embarrassing, it's potentially illegal and could result in a fine. So proper diagnosis is important. Uh, many of the laws may hold a uh, manufacturer responsible. So let's say like, if you misdiagnose a car, and the customer gets a lawyer, that they can actually hold Toyota responsible because the car's under warranty. See, so it's a big deal. Now, these are my own choice words. A trained monkey can replace parts as instructed. It's true. But a real technician needs to understand how to diagnose. And 
I'm very confident I'm right on that. You definitely need to learn how to replace parts and stuff. And we're going to do that in this class. But your ultimate goal should be to have a, a, a better understanding because look, diagnosing takes much more knowledge than replacing parts. So if all you want to do is learn how to do a, a brake job, like, dude, you don't even need to be in this class. I'm going to put some of this stuff that we do on YouTube. You could just watch a couple of YouTube videos and do the monkey see, monkey do. You could say, take those bolts out, put these things in, tighten those bolts up. You could replace stuff. Now, what stuff you're going to replace and why you're replacing it, that takes a lot better understanding. And understandably, people who can diagnose are the ones who are going to make mole money. And mole money, sometimes mole problems, but sometimes mole better. Okay, so I'm going to try to help you get there. And now, why do we need it? It is challenging to find the source of every customer concern. I could tell you firsthand. I've done a bunch of stuff. I got a bunch of experience. If you wanted to throw credentials and stuff down, generally speaking, I usually will, will outdo most people you'd be able to come up with. I still get my butt kicked sometimes. I still get beat up. I still have cars that are like, man, this one's really tough. So it's not easy. If you thought it was gonna be easy, I'm telling you right now, it's not gonna be easy. And if you come back to me and tell me it's easy, that's how I know that you'd be faking it till you'd be making it. You see what I'm saying? I could see right through that. Boom, not even hard. Even veteran technicians have difficulty tackling diagnosis sometimes, especially on new stuff. New stuff comes out, I really don't know. You know, I, I want to be in the new model class for every car I've ever worked on, but I can't always be in the new model class. So when a new model comes out with a new technology, I sometimes don't exactly know what's going on. So diagnosis is hard. Diagnosis on something new is even harder, right? And then applying strategy-based diagnostic process helps resolve challenging customer concerns in an efficient manner. So if a car comes in, and I don't know what's wrong, it's very tempting for me to roll out with the big old parts cannon and just start <laughs> replace that, replace this, replace. eventually something's going to fix it. That's not efficient. If the customer's paying the bill, you're draining the customer's bank account. If Toyota's paying the bill, you're draining Toyota's bank account. Now, maybe Toyota's bank account is huge, but it's still not efficient, right? So diagnosing it and replacing one part is always more efficient than replacing a bunch of parts and doing no diagnosis. You got to understand. All right. And then customer comebacks lead to impressions. Like you didn't do the work, right? If they come in with an ABS light on and you replace something and they leave and it comes back on, they think, oh, they didn't do it. They were supposed to replace that sensor and they didn't do it. When in reality, you may not, you may have replaced it. You just didn't replace the right part, but, but they don't even think that. They think you scammed them. They think you, you charged them money for the part and you never paid for the part and you never put the part in. You just took their money, right? So that looks bad. The other thing they could think is the shop's incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. That may be true, but even shops that know what they're doing, if they don't really follow strategy-based diagnostics, it's very easy to do a misdiagnosis. They may think the shop is trying to scam the customer. They may share bad reviews on Google, Yelp, and similar. And this is one that's newer. Back in the day, you know, if you misdiagnose something, you just, you know, the I'd see service managers throwing out free car washes and rental cars and just trying to take care of it. But now... Unfortunately, it's very easy for the customer to go and write some, blow them up on a horrible review. And that horrible review could cost them a lot more than just that one customer. See what I mean? That's a bad, it's a bad thing to be in that situation now. So let's take a look at the steps. Customer comebacks typically are going to be caused by, well, it may just be misinterpreted or misunderstood the concern. Maybe the customer saying, They've got a noise and you were chasing the wrong noise. Maybe the customer is saying, you know, they've got um, a vibration and you're chasing the wrong thing. This stuff happens. That may be partially on the service advisor because the service advisor is the one who asks them. But that's why we do 
the verification process, right? How about failure to verify that the original concern was resolved? So it could be two ways. You didn't understand what the problem was, so you were fixing the wrong problem, or you did understand what the problem was and you thought you fixed the problem, but you didn't verify the problem and you released it to the customer, that's still on you. So I'd say for me, a step one and step five are some of the um, are some of the most commonly skipped and missed, but those are like some of the most important when it comes back to customer comebacks. And then a systematic approach means like, you're not just flailing, you have a system, right? You verify, you research possible, you do specific tests, you perform the repair, you verify the repair. If you do that, generally speaking, you're gonna fix cars, you're not gonna have comebacks. That's the goal for everybody. Okay, and then of course, the first step, verify the concern. Now we talk a lot about this. Main purpose though, I wanna, I wanna elaborate even more. You, the purpose of this is to verify the vehicle is not operating as designed. Now in brakes, you know, we get some of these sometimes customer will say, oh, well, my brakes, um, you know, they, they just don't stop that well. Okay. And you go and drive it and they feel like they stop okay to you. What should you definitely not do in that instance? Say concern is unverified, have the customer drive the car to re, uh, to kind of have them show you their braking issue and not yours because they drive different than you drive, right? Right. So we really want to verify, is there something there? Is there not? What a lot of people have done, like, especially back in my day when Lemon Law was just kind of getting started, they would just be like, oh, a customer doesn't like their brakes, sell them a brake job. And they'd put new brakes on it. And then, and then the customer would come back and be like, same thing. So what Brandon said is right. We need to really we need to really verify this and it may be normal. And now if you go for a ride with the customer and like, do you feel that? And I'm like, I don't feel that. You may actually have to involve your foreman, your team leader, your foreman, or sometimes in a rare case, you might actually get like a Toyota FTS involved. And probably what you should do before you even go a step further is just talk with your team leader or foreman and say, hey, do I have permission to get the same type of vehicle off the lot, you know, a brand new. So let's just say um, I talked to the guy, he has a Highlander, um, a Highlander hybrid. And he's got, from what he's saying, he gets brake pulsations all the time. And he's he got a brake pulsation, he brought it in, they resurfaced the rotors. He drove for another few months, he got another brake pulsation, they replaced the rotors. He drove for another few months. He got another brake pulsation. And he's like, there's something wrong with this car. It's a lemon. It's a lemon. It's a lemon. And I was kind of looking at him like, well, I don't know that that's true. I mean, how many Highlanders have you driven? So well, I've only driven one. And I was kind of trying to explain to him, you know, they need, they need to really look into your issue that you can't just say it's a lemon and you need like a new car. You know, it seems to me that this may be actually normal condition. This guy's very aggressive with how he drives. I've seen him. He like, he's like, well, when I was, you know, I come down the hill from Big Bear, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm breaking. I, I've even, I can just visualize in my mind, just understanding the way he is. He's probably coming up right behind people and jamming his brakes on super hard driving very aggressively, and he does go up and down from the mountains a lot. I'm willing to bet you there's actually nothing wrong with the car. I'm willing to bet you the real issue is he just needs to not drive that aggressively. But the thing is, he took it in, they verified the pulsation, they cut the rotors, and then it pulsated again, they put new rotors on, and now he's kind of built a case on this dealer already. It's kind of saying, well, it's a lemon. I mean, it's already burned the brakes up twice. And and for me, I'm thinking, well, it didn't burn the brakes up. You you got the rotors too hot. I'm not sure that that's a car issue or a you issue, right? So that's that's the thing. You got to go proceed very carefully. Maybe the thing to do would have been to take him and say, look, we're going to go for a ride in a, another Highlander. You're going to drive it exact, exactly how you drive it. And 
if your rotors warp and the new Highlander rotors don't warp, then yes, we'll look into your issue. See what I'm saying? The best we can do is return it to how it was made originally. We can't do improvements. If, if as good as new is not good enough, then that they, then that we can't fix that. That's kind of the point. What we do not do, we don't re-engineer cars. We don't modify cars. We don't make them better than factory. You understand? That's not our role as dealership technicians. If you work for a performance shop, you could say, well, we're going to put on your drilled and slotted rotors, your high performance this, we're going to do big brake kit that. And that may actually make this guy happy. But see, the difference is he didn't want to pay for it. He hasn't paid a dollar. Toyota's paying the bill. Toyota's covering it under warranty. See how there's a big difference there? He may actually have to be told, look, the way you drive is not how this vehicle was designed. You know, this vehicle is not a NASCAR car. This vehicle is not Formula One. If you drive like Formula One, you're going to cause these issues. There's nothing wrong with it. So we got to be very careful. Our go-to would be compare to a known good. Now you guys work in the dealer. So you drive Corolla, 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 Corolla. You should know what's normal and what's not normal. The customer may not necessarily know what's normal, what's not normal. I had a guy insist that his AC was messed up on a brand new Silverado. I said, nope, no problem found. He came back again. The AC is still messed up. I said, well, it was never messed up and I never fixed it. So nothing's changed. And he was confused. And he said, well, it's still messed up. And I had to go and talk with him directly, bypass the service advisor. And I said, so what makes you think it doesn't work? And he says, well, it doesn't cool like my Dodge Ram did. I said, this isn't your Dodge Ram. I mean, your Dodge Ram's designed one way and the Silverado's designed another way. The dude was also like 500 pounds. So it was sad, but I was kind of saying like, I can't attempt a fix on this because it's not broken. I understand you're not happy with it, but if you're not happy with it, that's no longer a service department issue. That's when the customer would have to go back to sales and say, hey, look, I bought this truck. I bought this car. It doesn't suit my needs. Can you buy it back and give me all my money back and pay off my loan and take the car back? And they're probably going to say no. Okay. But, but what we do not do is try to modify the car to make the customer happy. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, and then we have to have a good understanding of what their issue is before we diagnose it. So we're not diagnosing the wrong thing. Additionally, document in writing details. If you don't document it, it didn't happen. So if I road test the customer's car for brake pulsation, but I don't say that I road tested it for brake pulsation legally, that never happened. Make sense? Even dumb things. If you check brake fluid level on that air conditioning one, if I put a thermometer in the vent and I measured his air conditioning temperature, if you don't write it, it didn't happen. If you don't write health check, you didn't do a health check. Make sense? So our documentation has got to be tight. Sometimes the customer concern is just concerns just a DTC set. So if the light's on, we verified the concern, the light's on. Got to troubleshoot it or whatever. Sometimes it may be apparent, like, oh, yep, there it is, boom. Other times it may be very difficult to duplicate. I've had stuff that I've had to drive home for days before I got to duplicate it, but I did. And I was able to fix it. So to just give it five minutes of road test time, it's not really a good service being provided. Okay, and then duplicating the concern most likely means road testing. So let me, let me break this down for you. You're not going for a test drive to see how it is. Like you're not like, oh, do I like it or not? You're basically using the road to test components. So if it's a brake concern and it's, only happening at highway speeds, you're basically using the highway to put the parts under the same conditions of the customer's concern. Make sense? Let's say it's a transmission issue. If it's a transmission issue on shifting from third to fourth, you're going to go on a road test and have it shift from third to fourth to test the parts. Kind of get what I'm saying? A test drive is more like 
oh yeah, this car's nice. I like it. I want to buy it or I don't want to buy it. See, so you can call it test drive, but I really want you to think of it more as a, a road test. You may need to drive on a particular road, particular speed over bumps for a long time at a certain temperature. It may be hot. It may be cold. It may be, it may be during the day. It may be during the night. Here's a crazy one that you guys will find interesting. We had a customer and they said they have, when they drive their car, they hear a clunk clunk. Think of all the things a clunk clunk could be clunk clunk, but it's only when taking a right at one particular intersection. It won't happen anywhere else except that intersection. I'm already thinking, I don't know if this is even anything to do with the car. And then having to be female, she said, but in addition to that, if it only happens if I leave my house before seven, if I leave before seven, it does it. But I, if I leave after seven, it doesn't do it. Think about that. Does that, is that even possible? Is that even possible? Doesn't make any sense. So we actually had to send a technician out to this customer's house before seven to go for a road test. And the customer went to this intersection and took a right and there it was, clunk, clunk. And they did it a couple of times, clunk, clunk. And then after seven, they came back and it didn't do it. Is your mind blown? But here's what you didn't know. When they came to the intersection before seven, there were no cars coming. So they'd roll the stop sign and they'd take the turn a little wide and they'd hit the manhole cover, clunk, clunk, the sewer cover, clunk, clunk. But then at 7.15, there was more cars. So they had to do a complete stop and they took the turn a little tighter and they didn't hit the manhole cover. No clunk, clunk. What was wrong with the car? Nothing. The driver. Exactly. But see that, unfortunately, some of this is our job. And, and, and it's kind of our job and it gets a little bit tricky, right? But if it, if it really comes down to actually fixing the car, sometimes we have to acknowledge there's nothing wrong with the car. It may be how they drive. It may be what time they leave their house, right? So that's why asking a lot of good questions makes sense. I'll give you another fun, just to really make sure you understand it. Customer, it's a, an, an old lady. Customer's concern is when she presses the brake pedal, Sometimes it goes to the floor. So job gets dispatched and they're like, man, I feel the brake pedal. The brake pedal feels good. It's firm. Troubleshooting the hydraulic system, checking the brake fluid, looking at the hoses, the brakes, the rotors, everything is good. Apparently. But then they say, hey, we can't get it to do it. When does this brake pedal go into the floor occur? She says, oh, yeah, it only happens on Sundays when I go to Costco. And they say, but not on a Tuesday. Oh no, if I go to Tuesday, if I go to Costco, no problem. Only on Sunday. And they say, well, do you ever go on Saturday? Oh no, no, I, I don't go to Costco on Saturday. I, I either go on Tuesdays or I go on Sundays. Tuesdays, the brake pedal's good. Sundays, the brake pedal goes to the floor sometimes. Again, you're looking at like, I don't know, this doesn't really make sense. This one though, there actually was something wrong with the car. On a Tuesday, she would pull straight into Costco. She'd see a spot. She'd turn in. She'd put it in park. Done. On a Sunday, she'd go to Costco. It was full. She'd go down the aisle. No parking spots. She'd turn. Go down this aisle. No parking spots. Turn. Go down this aisle. This car happened to have a loose wheel bearing. When she would turn, the rotor would flop like this because the wheel bearing was loose. And it would actually push the piston in a little. Then when she do the other turn, it flopped like this because the wheel bearing was loose and pushed the lower piston and then the upper piston and then the lower piston. By the time she went through three or four aisles, the piston was pushed back in and there was a big gap between the rotor and the brake pad. So the first time she hit the brakes, all that brake pedal movement would go toward taking up the gap and it wouldn't build pressure. So the first brake application would go to the floor. So it's actually a, a bad wheel bearing. And so it's pretty crazy, but sometimes the diagnosis can be kind of complex 
and, and getting a lot of information can make these seemingly impossible problems and symptoms a little bit more possible to diagnose. So, and then once in a while, um, you, once in a while, you have to understand if, if you don't duplicate it, you're guessing, but if once in a while you don't duplicate it, but there's a technical service bulletin that says, Hey, if they have this problem, that problem, and that problem, and it's in this year, make model range, you'd probably be okay to follow the TSB. If you ever got hauled into court and they said, why did you replace the wheel bearings in that car? You'd say, well, there's this technical service bulletin that matched the customer's symptoms. So I followed the technical service bulletin. See how that kind of makes sense. That's not, it's not like, oh, you guessed. TSBs kind of give you permission to just follow those. It's not really guessing anymore. All right, so it's some good information for you to consider. Now, when you want to be able to fix cars, sometimes you need to know what the history is. If you want to know what the history is, you can actually look up the service history. So these ones will actually tell you the history of the vehicle. A lot of times you can do that in your dealership has Reynolds Reynolds or CDK or something where you can look back in the history. Other times, if it's a Toyota vehicle, you can actually go on service lane and see the vehicle service history. But that's only work that was done at the Toyota dealers. If they had an oil change at Jiffy Lube, that doesn't show up in the service history. So sometimes service history is amazing and other times not so much, but it should help you determine what maintenance needs are. So if a car comes in and you look in the service history and they've never had some other critical things done, that's it's a good point to say, hey, looks like you need a timing belt or something. But also it could, it could give you an idea if it's ever had the right software updates. Sometimes there's updates. You know, when you go on TechStream, a lot of times it'll tell you if an update's available. Well, if you weren't at the dealer, you wouldn't have that ability. So, and then also it could be used if the vehicle's subject to like recall or something. So that's all kind of under service history. If there's a recall, it would be caught at that point. Now that's kind of not the technician's job, right? It's more service advisor. And now we're into a little bit more of the book specific stuff. So this is chapter one. We'll talk a little bit more about getting you book access, that's on me. Here's an example of a TSB, you know, or even a recall. You know, they'll give you specific steps on what to check for and, and whatnot. But uh, other times, you know, we're working right out of a service manual. So if it's an older car, it may be a literal service manual like this. But generally it's gonna be um, web-based. Also, sometimes what's pretty cool, they do have troubleshooting guides. So like, for example, Toyota calls that the problem symptoms table. If you had a car and it like had a long crank, you know, it's -na 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 -na. that would be called out in the problem symptoms table and it give you things to check and in what order. So it's pretty neat. And then additionally, you know, step two, that was all kind of part of step one. That's all gathering information or step one was uh, gathering. Step two is duplicating. When we get into, um, you know, like doing some more research, like what are the possible causes? You could do a few different things. So let's say that we're jumping into researching possible causes. Generally, if it's a soft pedal, it's gonna be something like air in the brake lines, hydraulic brake fluid leak or misadjusted rear shoes. Where did that research came from? That research came from my knowledge. If you don't have that knowledge, it's hard for you to understand what the possible causes are. That's why you really need to justify taking a class and learning a lot about the system. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to troubleshoot. Now, I'll tell you something that's offensive. You really, if all you want to do is replace parts, you don't need me. You don't need this class. You don't need the school. You don't need the financial aid. You don't really need any of that. All you really need is some time some tools, some cars, and some practice. You just replace stuff and you get good at replacing stuff. But to really diagnose, that's when you need a lot more of a base understanding, right? So for example, I know the three things that are most likely going to cause a soft pedal. I don't know which one it is though. See, so like 
What would you do if you had these few, air in the lines, a brake fluid leak, or misadjusted rear brake shoes? What should we do? What should we do with those three? Testing. Exactly. Test something. Narrow down the list. Process of elimination. So if I think that it's a hydraulic brake fluid leak, I can check for that. If I check and there's no brake fluid leaks, I cross that off, right? We start with a lot of possibilities, a big funnel, all these possibilities. And all we're trying to do is, is get it narrowed down so it's more manageable. And we're looking at like, okay, if it's not a hydraulic brake fluid leak, it's either air in the lines or a misadjusted brake shoe, brake shoes in the rear. And we could check one of those two. And, and let's say I think it could be air in the lines because... I see that it recently had some brake work done. I may check that one next, just hoping to strike gold. And if I have somebody hold their foot on the brake pedal and I crack the bleeder and a bunch of air comes out, yeah, I got it. See, so like at no point did I say sell the customer a bunch of stuff, right? We're troubleshooting, we're diagnosing, we're narrowing it down. And then you should be able to prove it. I proved it by cracking that bleeder loose and seeing the air. I know that's what it is. Now, I may even go ahead and kind of bleed the brakes and make sure it's fixed before I tell them. Then at that point, to be honest, if there's brakes in the, if there's air in the lines, I don't know exactly how it got there. So I may look a little further. If the brake fluid is old and it has water in it, I want you to remember water boils into, into a vapor, into air. So that car may actually need a brake flush, right? but I shouldn't sell a brake flush as a starting point. I shouldn't be like, oh, you got a spongy pedal? Well, let's start by doing the maintenance. Let's sell you a brake flush. That really sets off my OCD. Like, I don't even know if it's OCD, but that, that's ringing unethical alarm bells in my mind already. I would go so far as to say, you don't have a right to sell maintenance to a customer who has a concern. If you fix the concern, then I feel like you've earned the right to sell the maintenance. Make sense? Think about this. What if the car is going to be thousands of dollars to fix and you start skimming the gravy right off the top saying, oh, you need a brake flush. You need this flush. You need that flush. You're taking like hard earned money to do maintenance when there's an actual underlying problem. I'm really firm on the fact that I'm right on that one. The best the best technicians I've seen take a customer's car. What's your concern? Diagnose your concern. This is going to fix your concern. But by the way, you also need all this maintenance. I think that's fine, but not the other way around. Not, oh, how you doing today? Let me hook all this maintenance up. Let me do the coolant flush and this flush and the wallet flush. I'll flush that whole wallet right out. I'll flush that wallet so good. There ain't going to be no money in that wallet. And then after you do all the maintenance, then I'll actually look into your problem. No, no. If you do that, don't even tell anybody you knew me. You're like, nope, I don't even know. Like, depart from me. Like, no, 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 no. And kind of doing some detective work, maybe somebody bled it wrong, right? So at that point, you may probe a little bit and say like, did you have work done recently? Not because we're trying to blame someone, but like if you had your if you had your brakes bled somewhere else, they didn't bleed them right. I'm just trying to figure out, does it just need a brake bleed or is there some other underlying root cause that caused the air to get in there? See what I mean? You're being you're gonna be detectives. Okay, and then when we get into focus testing, that's when we're actually really on the car, right? So I kind of blended two and three. So two is like researching what it could be. And three is like actually doing the test, cracking the bleeder loose, measuring with a meter, something like these types of things. You should be eliminating as many potential causes with each test. So if one test is going to eliminate three possible causes, then I do that test first. Makes sense. Just trying to, just trying to take all the possibilities and get it to be the fewest possibilities in the quickest amount of time. Additionally, as you're doing this, you need to re record it on the repair order because that's going to ultimately become your technician story. So in the three C's, 
There's the concern. You're summarizing what the concern was. There's the cause. The cause is where you're gonna where you're gonna be writing. I tested this. I checked this. I measured that. I evaluated this. That's your story. What you did. That's how you justify getting paid. That's how you justify claiming your time. Make sense? And then continuing focus, focus testing. A test description could be brief. Not like, not like I had a friend to press the brake pedal while I opened the bleeder and checked to see if there was air or brake fluid. Like you just say, you know, I, I bled the brakes. Can be simple, but if you didn't specify that you bled the brakes, it never happened legally. Okay, and then the expectation should describe the result. So like when you bled the brakes, there was air, which is no good. Make sense? So there shouldn't have been air, but there was. And therefore that's a problem. So the spongy brake pedal, let's just go with this one. Technician inspected rear brake shoe adjustment within spec, inspected for air in the hydraulic brake system, no air in the system, tested master cylinder using isolation plugs and found the master cylinder seals leaking internally, causing the pedal to drop towards the floor. That's telling me that the master cylinder fit is bad, right? The master cylinder seals leaking internally. Cool. So it needs a new master cylinder. That would be three steps and the problem is identified, right? And so and there's a couple other options, you know, for if you're testing fuel pressure, expectation 65 to 100. Oh, this is transmission. Expectation 65 to 108 at idle, 285 to 321 at stall. The result, 80 PSI at idle, 300 at stall. Well, those are okay. Right. Those are both in spec. That would just say I did a test. It was in spec. Here's another example. If you have a spec and like in this case, we're reading 11.9 ohms. If you're supposed to be 10 to 14 ohms and you read 11.9, that's in spec. You just need to write that up. Tested, you know, anticipation was measurement is it's good or it's no good. All documented. Cool. And if you don't follow the, the, the diagnosis process, you could either A, be denied of the warranty claim. So that's for dealer people. If you don't follow the process and you don't document well, your dealer is not going to be able to get the money from Toyota. Makes sense. So your documentation is critical. If you don't specify you checked it, you didn't. It didn't happen, right? Picture sure it didn't happen. Well, this is more like document on the repair order or it didn't happen. And this is very common shortcoming of entry level text. I was horrible at this. I was so focused and excited about fixing the car. I forget to do good documentation. And I was always getting in trouble for that. I really was true. Um, and we get this feedback every time we have an advisory meeting, the dealers are saying documentation, they got to get better documentation. They're, they're sloppy with their clock on and clock off a job. So I'm giving you feedback. This is what we hear a lot. If you have good documentation, that's how you protect yourself against litigation. That means getting sued. And it's critical in fighting buyback cases. So there are scammers who will buy a Toyota or Lexus. They'll drive it for a year and then they'll make up a fake problem. And they'll hope a Toyota dealer tries to fix this fake problem. And once they try to fix a fake problem, they're on the hook. It's like they didn't fix it, but they tried. And then the dealer can't say, well, there is no problem because see, you already tried to fix it. So you're on the hook, see? And they'll literally drag this out and they'll can and they'll win in court and Toyota or Lexus will have to buy the car back and pay all sorts of other fees. And that person will just, there was a guy in Southern California, he did it to like four car manufacturers. He just didn't want to pay. So he basically drive the car for a year and then get it all paid back and he wouldn't he wouldn't pay a dollar he'd get all his money back there are scammers doing it so it's critical that we follow these processes so that we don't end up with our cars being bought back and then here's a quote from the field the pen is mightier than the wrench and while i hate to admit that it's absolutely true some of the people who can turn wrenches faster than any of us don't make any more money they don't necessarily solve any more problems. If you can't document and explain what you've done, it's hard to get you paid. 
and it's very difficult to defend in court. Okay. So you have to get good. Now I'll admit your story may not be physically written with a pen. Your story may be typed on the computer, but your wording and your story is more important than how fast you can turn that wrench. You believe me, it is true. Okay. And then the last step we really need to, we, 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 not the last step, but the next step, we need to perform the repair. Performing the repair is the easy part, generally. Sometimes they're a little bit harder than others, but like, at least we know what we got. We're going to follow service information. Again, every bolt has a torque spec. Follow the procedures, pay attention to detail, avoid a comeback by paying attention to details, right? And then last, um, oh, and additionally, use the correct tool. So if you don't have the right tools, you don't really have any business being a line tech, but using the wrong tools can cause damage to either the component, the bolt, et cetera. Using the wrong tool could potentially cause injury. Use the correct tool for the job will ensure better quality and safety for the tech, but overall doing the repair, it's not really the critical part. Um, and the customer needs to approve it. So you know what that means. If you say they need the brake shoes adjusted, you don't, you can't just adjust those. You need, you need to sell it to the customer and get a repair authorized before you can do it. So most states, they're all going to protect consumers by preventing on unauthorized services. When the customer comes in, they're signing for an estimate generally for diagnosis. If you find out what's wrong, you have to go back to them and give them an estimate again, supplemental estimate, and then perform the repair once they've agreed to it, okay? So don't get ahead of yourself. You can't just fix it and then tell the customer, well, you needed it. It doesn't work that way. That, I guarantee you that will not hold up in court. That's just a no, right? And then if the customer's paying, shop must receive a customer's approval prior to performing the reports for the repairs. If it's under warranty, the customer is not paying. So we still we still tell the customer we're going to do the repairs, but basically because Toyota's paying, we don't necessarily need to authorize any money because there is none. Cool. And then of course, maybe the most important step, by the way, verifying the repair. Probably whatever you did to duplicate it is what you're going to have to do to verify it. So if it took a road test to duplicate it and you fix it, you're probably gonna have to road test it to verify it. Kind of make sense? If it had a code set and you checking codes duplicated it, when you're done fixing it, you're probably gonna recheck for codes and verify there's no codes. See what I'm saying? It's not real complicated. Um, and then also after you're done, it may be a good idea to take a look at the vehicle after the road test, just to make sure you didn't forget something. You didn't forget your flashlight. You didn't leave something loose. You know, it's, you shouldn't leave something loose the first time, but it's not a bad idea just to do a recheck just in case. Okay. And then document it, document it, document it. You need to do it for OEM aftermarket. You need to do it for the customer. Keeping the service records is not only going to help you, but it's required by law. Okay. And then if there is a comeback, this is gonna help us understand what's going on and possibly protect ourselves. And then a lot of dealers have a warranty clerk, which the warranty clerk is gonna review things to make sure everything is in order before they submit it to let's say Toyota in our case. If the warranty clerk is dinging you, don't be real mad at the warranty clerk. You kind of gotta be like, the warranty clerk is making sure it's in order to send to Toyota corporate. Makes sense. If the warranty clerk didn't catch it, and Toyota corporate caught it, that's worse. Good, and then as you can see, the three Cs, concern, cause, correction. Toyota calls it something different, do you see that? The CC and Rs, concern, cause, and remedy, but sometimes I hear it called repair. So the three Cs or the CC and Rs, you live or you die by those from here on out. You need to know those, you need to use those. If I have you do a job, you're gonna write it up. Concern, cause, correction, or concern, cause, and remedy repair. That's how I want you to present stuff to me because that's how you're going to do it. So the concern, that's what's wrong. That's the What is the customer's concern when they come in? What is it? You have to understand it before you can proceed. 
the cause of the details, the diagnosis, and basically what you have done, right? What have you done to determine that's what was wrong, right? And then the correction, that's generally just the repair procedure, not your diagnosis, but actually the repair. And, and that should include the parts you replaced and what you did to verify the repair would be under the correction or the repair remedy as well, right? How did you verify it? Did you drive it? Whatever. Did you check for codes? These types of things. And then other parts, sometimes we may um, run into something like, let's say a car comes in for a warranty concern and the tires are like me, a little low on tread. You know, they might look good though, but they might be a little you know, two 30 seconds or maybe no 30 seconds. We would document that, right? They may decline the repair. They may say, you know what? I don't want to buy new tires from you. I just want you to fix my stuff. We need to, we need to document that it needs tires and what the measurement was, because if the customer leaves in the hydroplane, they will very quickly turn on you and say, they never told me. I never knew. And then you'd say on the repair order, it's right here and you signed it. See what I'm saying? So anything we want to recommend needs to make it on that repair order and let the customer decline it if they're going to decline it. If you don't recommend it and then, some, then it causes something, the customer has a little bit of a foothold to say, well, I didn't know I needed tires. I didn't know I needed brakes. I didn't know I had a fuel leak. And then all of a sudden, now you're not, you don't have your T's crossed and your I's dotted. And now you might be a little bit at fault for that. So you've got to really watch out. All right. And then as you can see, everything goes on the repair order. That was all about the repair order and all the processes. Okay. Now the next one. Now let's take, um, well, we'll take a, a, a few moments here. Let me do a quick pause. Got to remember to redo that. So you guys have been sticking with me pretty good. Now you can talk off of recording. You want to, we've got quite a bit left to do with breaks. You want to take a little 10 minutes. You want to keep pushing what you want to do. I'll check the chat. Give me some, give me some uh, feedback. Let's take a 10. Anybody not want to take a 10? Push you pretty hard. I see a keep going. I see a keep pushing. I got quite a few keep pushings. Let's continue, please. Ooh. Mitchell, I'm sorry. If you're going to take a 10, you're going to have to take that 10. Okay, so the continue is going to be... I'm on slide 67. I got 110. I think it'll probably be an hour. Might be under an hour, but, it, but, but it's probably going to be in that ballpark. If you want to do let's go, then I guess we've got nothing to say. Let me just have a nice little sip of my uh, almond milk here. And we just uh, roll it. I got, I got a little bit more almond milk in there. Yeah. <clears throat> so this part will, will not be about Strategy-based diagnostics, this is about breaks. It's just introduction of breaks though. Yeah, I see you, you Nate, just 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 do it, dude. Just do it. You can do you can do the lift. All right, here we go. You hold your questions for me. All right, so part two is just about breaks specifically. I want you guys to look at this picture because this picture is going to really set the tone for the whole breaks curriculum. Um, let's say we pick on, since he just got steamrolled over by the, by the group, here's Mitchell. There Mitchell was playing with his basketball and uh, it bounced out in the road and Mitchell went ahead and chased it into the road. Now here's, uh, I don't know. I don't know who you, who you want, who you want, who's driving the car here. Roberto. I I knew it was gonna be Roberto. Good old Roberto. There Roberto is, and he's barreling down on this thing, and he all of a sudden sees Mitchell and he's like, All right, brakes. 
don't fail me now. Just, just feel that, you know, just feel that like when the breaks are needed, they're needed. Don't fail me now. So when, when we're working on this type of stuff, when it comes to break stuff, it's like, it needs to be on point. See, that's not really the place to cheap out. That's not really the place to be like, eh, close enough. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I don't think so. So consider that we're talking about torque specs. We're talking about quality parts, something related to the brakes. That's no good. Write it up, write it up. Brakes are low, write it up. Brake hoses are cracked, write it up. Brake lines are rusty, write it up. Make sense? If there's nothing wrong with it though, don't write it up. But, but again, if it's not documented and let's say the brakes do fail and Roberto mows down Mitchell, he survives, but he hurts him. Now there's money, lawsuits, et cetera. What you don't want is to be like, oh yeah, I just worked on that car. And you know, yeah, I saw the brake lines were, it was a back East car. I saw the brake lines were rusty, but like, I didn't want to do the job. So I didn't write it up. You know what I mean? Like, and then boom, the brake line blows and they can't stop. And this kid's run over. No offense, Roberto. They don't really want your money. You don't have enough. You know whose money they want? The dealerships. The dealerships money. So as soon as that lawyer, you know what what um, they get? They hire the law firm. Dewey, Cheatham, and How. You ever heard of them? Dewey, Cheatham, and How. Say that fast. Say that back to me. Dewey, Cheatham, and How. So that they're gonna Dewey, Cheatham, and How is that unethical law firm that's just looking to cheat people out of their money? You know what I'm saying? Like that. Mm -hmm. So they hired Dewey, Cheatham, and How. And they're like, look, my brake line blew. I want to sue that dealer for everything. Take, take all the money. Dave Wilson, Lithia, Group One, whatever. We're, we're take them, take everything they got. They got, they got, they got deep pockets. So you really got to think about that when you're doing this. Is it real likely? No. But is it possible? Yes. Is it possible that it wasn't quite as horrible as Mitchell getting run over it might just simply be going off the road or or tapping somebody's rear bumper or rear ending them as soon as something goes wrong it's my experience with human nature soon as something goes wrong somebody's looking for somebody to blame I'll even admit that sometimes that's me too when I screw up it's like oh it's somebody was put, I got a ticket on the way into class I think it was actually this summer I ain't got a ticket in like five years I used to be getting tickets all the time I got to take it on the way to class. And like immediately I was wanting to tell the cop about how it wasn't really my fault. And this was my defense. I was coming through an intersection. I see, I saw the cop oncoming. He was motorcycle cop too. I saw him oncoming. I'm like, yeah, whatever. No big deal. I'm not doing anything wrong. And I went to go through this intersection and uh, like, you know how the, when the cars are turning and they just keep going and going, like the light's green and there's like three or four cars that haven't even barely entered it yet. And they just keep going. And I'm like, seriously? So I'm already kind of like, not irate, crazy mad, but like a little bit aggressive. You know, I'll start, I'll start rolling into the intersection being like, I got a green light and I've had a green light. So it's not that you kind of caught the tail end of a red, like this is just blatant. So I start rolling through. You know, and then I'm looking at somebody face to face. I'm looking in their driver's window and I'm on my bike and I'm just like, seriously. And so then as soon as I get by him, you know, I just, I just took off kind of quick. And then, uh, that was, well, that's where I messed up. I took off kind of quick. And the next intersection was a left onto the free, freeway ramp. So, you know, when you, when you got the juice, sometimes you give it the beans, you know what I'm saying? So when I got on the freeway, I just punched it, you know? So I just, I hit red line first, second, you know, and then I just shifted up into third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and just bogged it out right there. Problem that I didn't catch though, the cop did a, it does have VTEC, Kenny, no joke. It's my VFR has VTEC for real. Kicks in like 70, 7,200 or 7,600 though, way different than a car, but it red lines at like 13.5. So I didn't know he was behind me. 
that was the problem. And then all of a sudden, like I look and I'm like, oh man, there's a there's a cop on a Harley. Oh, that's the guy I passed oncoming. Well, I didn't realize it. He did a U-turn. Like I think he got off the freeway to to southbound freeway to get on to go back north on the on the freeway. But I didn't know he was back there. And so that's what I'm saying. I didn't go real crazy fast, but like I was frustrated with the intersection. So I just punched it to kind of like bleed off a little bit of stress He'd behind me the whole time. So he pulls me over. He's irate. He was kind of unstable. Scream at me. What the heck is wrong with you? And I was like, I'm sorry. I don't understand. Like nothing's wrong with me. And then he's kind of like, you went, you were like a, a hundred. And I said, no, 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 not a hundred. He said, well, I had to do a hundred to catch you. And I said, well, that may be true. I mean, I gave it wide open throttle for a second. I, I, it'll pull pretty hard up to 80, you know, and it might've been 90, but, but it might've been 80. And he was just furious. And then he was kind of like, well, I pulled you over. And I said, man, so wait a minute. And he said, do you even know where I was? And I said, I don't have any idea. And he said, I was right behind you. You made me chase you. And I said, no, 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 no. I didn't make you chase me. If I knew that you were behind me, I wouldn't have done that, sir. And he said, oh, I thought you were, you know, trying to run. And I said, no, no, no. If I was going to run, we wouldn't be having the conversation. You would call in the helicopter and I get busted the hard way. And he said, well, 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 you didn't know I was back there. And I said, no, I, didn't you see what happened? Wait a minute. If you were behind me, you saw all those cars roll the intersection. That's really frustrating. You know, so I just, I just punched it to try to, you know, like, I was just frustrated, you know, and I got to get to work and like, I don't have time for these games. And they, he wrote me anyway for 90, but the point being, even me, I immediately was kind of saying like, it's not my fault. Those people were running the lights. You know, what about them? What about, you know, so I think it's in human nature. I think it'd be fair to say probably all of us would do that to some extent. If you were to get in a car accident and you were to have somebody not do a good job on your brakes or not notice something, you'd be probably at least tempted to somehow blame the technicians, right? And that's you. And I'm going to give you, you all benefit of the doubt and say, you, you got a good heart. There are people that don't have a good heart. They have a, a hardened, nasty, unethical, terrible heart. They're literally looking to hurt someone, to get someone sued, to get someone fired, right? So we got to really, as they say, mind our P's and Q's, cross our T's and dot our I's with brakes. So I, I really want you to understand when we're talking about doing brake work, it's not what you can get away with. It's like, Get it in spec so that when something goes wrong and those people are going to try to blame you, you're clear all the way. So I took the ticket, I paid the fine, I actually hired, you know, a company to fight the ticket and they did a horrible job and they got nothing. And so just paid it. Lesson learned. Okay. So now you know that uh, he didn't technically get run over, but we got to consider that. Let's just say we look into the systems. And I'm going to make a follow-up video for this. Um, we can make we can make some videos, but we're going to do quite a few activities at uh, at the school to explain these systems. But one is going to be called the service brake. The service brake is the main brakes. When you push the brake pedal, that's the service brakes. The service brakes slow or stop a vehicle when it's in motion. Essentially, you just consider those the brakes, but there's a little bit of a reason why we're calling it the service brakes. Operated by a foot pedal. Consists of drum and or disc brakes. So it might be on an old car, it was drum front, drum rear. Up until like the late 60s. Uh, and, and some cars had disc earlier, but you would, the manufacturers could legally sell a car or truck with drum front and drum rear up until I think about like, 69 or something 1969 then they became disc mandatory in the front every car since i think 1969 or 70 or right around there has had disc in the front they may have disc in the rear but they may have drum in the rear so in the rear it could be either one and now i'm just talking about the service brakes not the parking brakes and so could be one or the other right so now we jump into the parking brake 
used for, wait a minute, something ain't right. Like that. You remember that guy? So parking brake, service brake. You parking brake used for holding the vehicle in place when it's stationary. Service brake used for slowing down or stopping a vehicle when it's in motion. Do you see the difference there? This is not really used for stopping a vehicle that's moving. In the case of emergency, you use that or whatever the heck you want to use. In case of emergency, you use whatever you, you got a parachute, use that too. You got a friend in the passenger seat, have him go ahead and hop out halfway and drag his feet to try to stop you. I'm talking to you from experience. You guys don't know what it's like to be driving rusty hoopties and having a brake line blow. Be like, I can't stop, drag your feet. It's like that, you know what I'm saying? Junk, trash. So the parking brake is the parking brake. Who has called it traditionally the e-brake in the past or the emergency brake? It's okay. That's kind of slang term. The parking brake is designed to hold it while it's parked, period. That's it. That doesn't mean you can't use it in case of emergency, but it's not designed for that. Make sense? It's also not designed to really start off your drift. Like, like first off, if you have enough horsepower, you shouldn't really need that handbrake anyway. But if you're really trying to be fancy and you want to do, you know, uh, uh, some sort of a handbrake drift entry, then convert it to hydraulic and have it actually use the hydraulic so you can make some real pressure. Don't do this janky handbrake to a cable thing. See what I'm saying? The handbrake was designed with a cable just to stop it from rolling. And, and that was mainly for manual. And if you had an automatic, you can use it to supplement your parking pawl, P-A-W-L, in your transmission. All right, and then sometimes they're foot activated. You guys have seen these. Very nice. Now let's talk about brake systems and how they work. This is gonna get into a little bit, um, a little bit of the science sometimes too. So modern is hydraulically operated. That means we're using hydraulics. That means basically we're using brake fluid. We're using pistons, an input piston, an output piston. You know, they have seals, there's lines, hoses, et cetera. Um, there's two main sections. The brake assemblies at the wheels, which would be calipers, rotors, pads. And then we're looking at like basically the hydraulic system that applies them. Those are the two main sections. Additionally, hydraulic force is increased or decreased using cylinders of different sizes. So the engineers will design a brake system with different piston sizes and cylinder sizes to get the desired forces. Now that may be like based on the weight of the vehicle or the application of the vehicle, or sometimes it's got to do with front and rear. So if you have a car that's got all the weight in the front because it's front wheel drive, front engine transverse, they're gonna have certain piston sizes in the front and different piston sizes in the back so that we get you know, kind of like a different, uh, different amount of brake force on the front compared to the rear, probably a lot more on the front, right? So they, the hydraulic system's designed pretty precisely. And then pistons in the cylinders force friction linings into contact with the braking surfaces. So the friction lining, I want you to remember that. Friction lining, that's the actual brake pad, like the brake um, friction material. Um, in fact, I'm gonna show you. Give me one sec, I got one. In case you thought it was a virtual background, it's not. These are actually brake pads for a Tesla, um, but Tesla has two different style brakes. And I got a whole brake kit, like a brake package from Rock Auto with the wrong rear pads. And I knew they were the re wrong rear pads, but it was cheaper to buy the brake kit and then buy the right rear pads than it was to buy it all separate. So if we look at this, I want to point something out using this pen. This part right here is metal. So all this down here, that's like the metal backing. 
the lining is all this material up here. So if you look, see how it looks kind of like um, a little bit rough. There's a lot of friction there. That's the lining. So this lining is going to be pressed into the rotor. If it was a brake shoe, it'd be pushed into the drum. So when we talk about linings, y'all know what I'm talking about. That's the soft stuff that wears away on the brake pad. Okay. So continue. What that does, it converts the friction between the two surfaces. So the friction of the pad lining to the rotor, there's a lot of friction there. It converts kinetic energy into heat energy. Whoa. So it's basically a, it's an energy converter. It's what it is. The kinetic energy is the speed and the weight of your vehicle. So it's like, it's like mass times speed is a quantity of energy. So if you have, um, let's say a bicycle and you're pedaling your butt off and you're going 20 miles an hour, that has a specific amount of kinetic energy, but that's gotta be you, your, the bicycle, your body, everything, and it's speed. Compare that to a Camry going the same speed, 20. Which one do you think has more kinetic energy? The Camry and you weigh close to 4,000 pounds. Think about that. Definitely the Camry, right? The Camry is much heavier. You're both going 20, but your bicycle and you are light and the Camry and you are much heavier. So there's a larger quantity of kinetic energy. Now that's important because kind of what I'm leading into is like the size of your brakes all have to do with how much kinetic energy your vehicle is going to have because it needs to it needs to take that kinetic energy which is momentum right it needs to take that momentum and basically take the momentum and reduce your momentum and using friction turn that momentum into heat so if you were to jam the brakes on your bicycle you make a little bit of heat but if you were to jam the brakes on the Camry you're going to make a lot more heat and so the more heat that we have to make by arresting the kinetic energy, the larger the brakes have to be. And that's all designed from the factory. And of course you can upgrade it with a big brake kit. But the reason I really bring that up is like, let's say you had, um, I don't know, we could, we could say, make it a little more interesting. Let's say it's a Toyota 86 or a BRZ. Um, those cars are lighter. But let's just, you know, and they're and they'll design the brake system for that car. But let's just say, I mean, this might be offensive, but let's just say you LS swap it. Any objections? Okay, fine, fine. We'll keep it your brand. You'll do the two JZ swap. Okay. Okay. You do, or you could do the, the BMW super swap, whatever. You you trip double or triple its horsepower. Now that car is going to go faster. Is it a very good build? If you tripled the horsepower and gave it the ability to go twice as fast, but you still have the same brakes. Those brakes were more designed for the stock 86. If you make the 86 like a high horsepower beast, you should make the brakes a high ho horsepower beast, right? Because your brakes are sized to take a certain amount of kinetic energy and kinetic energy is mass times speed. You didn't make the car heavier. You might have even made it lighter, ideally, but you've increased its ability to for speed. So your brakes are now basically not up to the task, right? So if we look at this, um, for example, this customer, I assume is female. I may have assumed her gender, um, is pushing on the brake pedal. This brake pedal is getting 50 pounds. This is not saying the female is 200 pounds. The, it's saying the female is pushing 50 pounds on the brake pedal. The brake pedal has leverage. The brake pedal has a booster. The brake pedal has a master cylinder. And through the, through the three of those, right? Leverage the booster and different size pistons in the master cylinder. We're able to produce 400 pounds of force to the front wheels and 200 pounds to the rear wheels. Why do you think we want more on the front anyway? Give you a clue. 
when you're braking, you know how the car nose dives? All the brake force going to the front or, or all the weight shifting to the front means we can apply more brake force to the front because there's a lot more weight on those tires and they're less likely to lock up. Now, the same is true for the back. There you go. You nose dive, right? And the back end's way up in the air. You don't really want a lot of brake force on those because those are already kind of light. They're not really settled onto the road that much. There's just a little force on those. So if you put too much brake force, you'll actually start fishtailing. You'll lock your rear brakes up and be all kinds of crazy. So Toyota actually calls it the brake force distribution. The engineers will figure out what, what a good split is for the brake pressures. And that's based on, mostly based on the weight distribution of the vehicle. So like ideally 50-50, but Camry is more like 80-20. 80% 80 of the weight's in the front and 20% in the back. So they design all that. And then like another thing that we'll um, look into is um, in the service brakes, not the parking brakes, but we'll actually also have ABS. So if you look like, let's say you punch the brakes, right? We send, we send fluid, I'll, I'll back up even. You'll step on the brake pedal. The brake pedal will push on a piston. The piston in the master cylinder will push on fluid. The fluid will be pushed down a hose or a line. And then the fluid right here will push on a piston or sometimes more than one piston. And that'll squeeze the pads into the rotor. But the whole time we're going to be increasing force or at least modifying our force. But let's just say, right, because we can do a really good job with the brake distribution. But let's just say we jam the brakes in a panic stop. It's very possible that these pads may squeeze the rotor so hard we lock the wheels up. If you lock up your front wheels, how's your turning work? You lock up the front wheels and you turn left, you know where you go? Straight. You lock up your front wheels and you turn right, you know where you go? Still straight. As you can see, into the boxes. So I want to clarify right off the bat, ABS is not to reduce stopping distances. ABS is anti-lock brake system so that if your caliper locks, it will actually release pressure so it'll unlock. And when it unlocks, you're able to maintain some traction on the front tire so you can steer. So this ABS, this non-ABS car blasted through the boxes. This ABS car was like, hit the brakes. The brakes might've locked up for a second and then they unlocked because of anti-lock brakes and they were able to swerve around the boxes. Meanwhile, all the customers got to do, or the driver has just got to keep their foot on the brakes and the ABS will take that brake pressure and, and reduce it and reduce it and reduce it only as needed to at least to maintain control. So ABS are just, ABS is there basically just to help you do a collision avoidance while maintaining control. That's what it does. It doesn't make you stop faster necessarily. Now it may have stopped faster in this case because what can happen is with no ABS, you can lock up your brakes and if you panic and you keep holding the pedal, the tires will continue to skid. And what do you think happens to that rubber as they're skidding? You create a flat spot. True. And even in the moment though, that rubber turns into like a slimy, slippery liquid and you'll just zzz right across the ground. Technically, if you really wanted to stop as fast as possible, you do slight pumping of your brakes with non-ABS. But as good as you might be able to do it, the computer can do it better. It can pump your brakes many times per second and actually be much more effective. And plus, in a panic situation, you know it's hard to tell a, a driver to say, oh, in a panic situation, why don't you remember to pump your brakes? Be steady. They're, they're freaking out. All they're doing is pressing the brakes harder and harder and screaming like this, like that. Okay. So forget that the computer needs to pump the brakes because the customer is not going to pump the brakes. So there's just a little bit out, a little bit about ABS and electronic brake control generally is kind of all, at least for now, we're going to group them in. And another thing to consider is when you're braking, right, you have force coming into that tire when we're braking, that force is going to basically try to throw the suspension. And so 
all of your braking force has to be absorbed by the not only the suspension, but also by the tires. So let's just go back to that Toyota 86 you built with the, uh, we'll just call it the 2JZ swap, okay? That way nobody's offended. You built the you built the 86 with a really cool 2JZ. It makes all this type of power. And then you realize your brakes can't handle the power. So what do you do? You put a big old brake brake kit on there. But think about it. If you still have the same crappy tires, your tires are the ones touching the ground. If your brakes are super power, they can stop your tire. But if your tire can't maintain traction of the ground, you're still not stopping the car. And additionally, if your suspension can't absorb the forces of the brakes, you're not really able to even have done the big brake kit in the first place, you know? So a lot of times brakes, tires, suspension, they all go together. It's, it's sort of like a stool. Like, let's say you come up to a stool you're going to sit in and it's got three legs. Which leg can you remove and still sit in it? None of them. You need all three, right? So they, they go together. None of them can stand alone without the other two. And so additionally, it talks about the weight transfer. So we'd like we talked about, you jam the brakes, the weight is shifting to the front. It's pushing the front tires down. Those tires got good traction. These are the tires we really want to send the braking force to. These ones back here, not so much. So we get into even later proportioning valves. The ABS system is critical in this type of situation. This is also the reason did you guys know in, in a front wheel drive car, where should your best tires be? Mm. You would think, and many people do, but no matter if it's front wheel drive or rear wheel drive, the best tires are always supposed to be in the back. And it's for this reason right here. When you're braking, all your forces go into the front. These tires actually are going to be less likely to lose traction because they have more weight on them. These light tires, we definitely need our better tread on the rear. And it's probably even more apparent if you're trying to go around a turn in the rain and you're going to hydroplane, you really need your best tires on the rear. And later when we do tires, we're actually going to show a video that's put on by, I think Michelin did it, but, but all the tire manufacturers agree, Michelin, Goodyear, Firestone, everybody who's anybody, all say your best tires go on the back. So this is also where, you know, tires kind of get related to brakes in the weight transfer as well. So it's kind of interesting. Now, here are some of the, the factors, right? So if a customer says my vehicle's not braking correctly, you may have to remind them the condition of the road, the surface of the road, the weight of the vehicle, the load on the vehicle while it's stopping, the height of the vehicle, how they're driving and the tires all affect how your brakes work. So they may come in for a braking concern and you may find their tires look like this. In which case, new pads and rotors aren't gonna do anything. They may say, oh yeah, when it rains, I hit the brakes, my car just slides and I spin in circles and I do 360s. That doesn't really sound like a braking problem actually, but they don't know that. Right. Additionally, look at this one. Like this truck right here doesn't have any weight in it. And this truck right here, this is the same truck after they load a bunch of weight in there. These are going to handle and break very differently. Some of these, by the way, actually have special valving that'll send more brake pressure to the rear when it's under load and less when it's light. It's kind of cool. And then, for example, these tires probably not going to hydroplane. These tires probably going to hydroplane. Good braking, bad braking. No problem with the brakes though. Right, and then kinetic energy again, that's the energy of an object in motion. The faster it is and the heavier it is, the greater the energy. But I wanna help clarify that a little bit. And this is where you can do um, some engineering if you want. If you like math, this is, this is your moment. Here we've got a 2000 pound car. That's nice, that's gotta be like a Mazda Miata. And it's going 20 miles an hour. <clears throat> it's making in that moment 26,743 foot pounds. So instead, there's what we do. 
we take that Miata and we pork it up a little bit and make it into a Camry. Matter of fact, this is a Mustang now. We, we take a Miata, we make it a Mustang. It was 2,000 pounds, now it's 4,000. Its kinetic energy did what? From 26,000 to 53,000. What's that number? That'd be doubled. So if you double the weight of a car, it doubles its kinetic energy. Kind of makes sense, right? That's how math works. But now this is, this is where I'm going to fool you. If we take that Mustang and it's going 2,000, uh, it's going 20 miles an hour, it makes 53,000 foot pounds. And we double this, we, let's see, we quadruple the speed. It went from two, four, six, eight. We quadruple the speed. Shouldn't it quadruple the kinetic energy? Because if we quadruple the kinetic energy, now you're talking about like 210 foot, 210 um, foot pounds, right? We doubled the weight from two to 4,000. It doubled the kinetic energy. We quadrupled the speed, so it should quadruple the kinetic energy, but it doesn't. What the heck is that number? It went from 53,000 to 855. That's not quadruple. What is it? It's a fun term. It's exponential. That's what exponential is. It's to the square root. So speed has a, what we call the exponential increase. Exponential is not just, a, not just a term we throw around loosely, by the way. It means literally mathematically it's an exponential growth. So it's, it squares it. If you now have your Mustang going 80, we have much, much, much more kinetic energy. So what should those Mustang brakes look like? Mm -hmm. Big brimbos. Big. Now, what if it was an LFA that could do 179 miles an hour? Now we need big, big, big brakes, right? So, so while trucks have big brakes because they're heavy, supercars have huge, huge, huge brakes because they're so fast, they make way more kinetic energy than even a big heavy truck. Cool. So that's why when we get into performance stuff, you're looking at like massive brakes, carbon ceramic rotors, huge venting in the, in the fascia and the bumpers and in the fenders. We're because all that heat needs to, needs to be, it needs to get out. So we'll actually design the body in a way where we can manage that heat. So it's kind of interesting. And then here's a Toyota specific slide. So Toyota agrees with exactly what we were covering for the book, doubling the weight, does double the energy. Doubling the speed does four times the energy. Again, so it's 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 exponential increase. Now here's a little bit of a, a lesson about acceleration. Acceleration, both acceleration and deceleration are a form of acceleration. It refers to an, a, a change in an object's speed, but we want to be more specific here. Acceleration means to means to increase a speed, right? So like, how do we accelerate a car? We use the engine, we use the power, we burn the gas, we supercharge it, we turbocharge it, and then we nitrous it. You know what I'm saying? That's what we do like that. But, and that's how we pop little wheelies. But then when we go to slow it down, there's still a lot to that as well. So we're gonna decrease an object's speed. Brakes cause a vehicle to decelerate. It's going to vary the amount of force. The force of the brakes have to absorb the kinetic energy of the vehicle. So again, if you want a car that's going to do 200, you need some brakes that are going to deal with a million foot-pounds plus. See, so like we're talking some really strong, big, heavy-duty, able to manage a lot of heat brakes. And you can see this... Uh, challenger skidding to a stop and so let's take a look at how energy is transformed you guys know you've heard of this uh energy cannot be neither created or destroyed and i'm sure you've heard that before and i got no argument sounds about right to me a little bit of a debate of where it came from but let's just say energy used to cause a vehicle to accelerate and decelerate, it's just passing back and forth. So 
if a if a let's say like in this next slide it's pretty fun if you look at this vehicle whatever energy it took to get the piece of crap up the hill it's now going to effectively pick back up going down the hill now it's not at 100% because we lose some to friction and some losses or whatever but this vehicle by the time it gets down to the bottom of this hill is going to have picked up a lot of kinetic energy now we'll back up for a second in the engine we make the car go by giving it the go juice. You heard of the go juice? Who's got the go juice? That's gas. And we are basically taking the fuel, which has chemical bonds, right? Let's say gasoline has all these chemical bonds and we're going to mix it with air. We're going to compress it. We're going to spark it. And then we're going to literally break those chemical bonds apart. That's where the energy comes from. Got to understand that when you're driving a car, you're extracting energy from the chemical bonds in the gasoline, and we're we're manipulating those to, to break them, break them, break them, break them, break them, break them. And it goes, and it sounds sometimes beautiful, I would say, but it is still chemistry and it's physics. It sounds a lot better than the chemistry and the physics I remember in high school, but it is. And that makes kinetic energy when we accelerate, cool. And then like, again, when we decelerate, we have to do a conversion. So accelerate was a conversion to break the bonds of the fuel to make horsepowers. If it's an electric car, we're taking the electrons and we're sending them to their death by forcing them to go through a motor and they go, and there's no sound, but they can do it kind of fast though. I got to admit when we're at the top of the hill and we go down the hill Right? right here, we had a bunch of potential energy. When we go down the hill, that potential energy becomes actual kinetic energy. That's movement. Cool. This car on the top was stopped, but it was on top of the hill. So it had a lot of potential. It's just like you guys. You have a lot of potential. But if you never actually get your rear ends in motion, you're never going to turn into a real actual energy. You'll never reach your potential. See what I'm saying? So once you're moving, you've got some kinetic energy. Now, if we want to stop that kinetic energy, that's where the brakes come in. The brakes are essentially a converter. They convert kinetic energy into heat energy. They squeeze and they make friction against the rotor and they arrest that kinetic energy. And then what do they do with it? Because remember, we can't take kinetic energy and hit delete. It doesn't work that way. Remember, it can't be created or destroyed. All we're doing is moving it, repurposing it. So we take that kinetic energy using the brakes, we create heat energy. How much heat? Proportional to the kinetic energy it arrested, right? So the more kinetic energy something has, the more we have to arrest, the more heat there's going to be. So if that car is coming down from 200 miles an hour, there's going to be some heat. You're going to be smelling those brakes. You better have ducting and louvers and fins and drilled and slotted. And I mean, you better have that thing like built to the max to handle that amount of heat. So it's kind of fun if you think about it. Brakes are, they convert kinetic energy into heat energy. That's what they do. Now we need to use friction though. And friction is the resistance created by surfaces in contact. So static friction, for example, if you had your shoe set on your table, that shoe has an amount of static friction. It's going to take a certain amount of force to get it to move. But then kinetic friction is when they're moving. So it may have one, one static number. And then once it's moving, it's going to take a certain amount of force to keep it moving, right? A shoe, because it has a rubber sole, has a really good, a strong kinetic, uh, a strong coefficient of friction. But let's just say it was um, a banana peel. Good old Mario Kart trick. You think a banana peel under your car tire is gonna have a good amount of coefficient of friction? I mean, that's the whole Mario joke. There's no coefficient of friction there. And next thing you know, you spin out of control. I made a whole video game based on that. So the, a, a, something's coefficient of friction is going to drastically change how it stops or how it holds. So I'll give you an example. A steel block on a steel plate, 
with 100 pounds of load on it is going to take a, with a coefficient of friction of 0 0.2 is going to take, let's see, 20 pounds to move. 20 pounds, even if it's a 100 pound block, it'll only take 20 pounds to move it. Cool. Make sense? What if it was a hundred pound block of rubber on a steel plate? How much force would it take to move? That'd be 80. How can that be? It's the same weight. And that's because coefficient of friction. So coefficient of friction, basically the steel block is smooth. It's going to slide easy. The rubber block is grippy it's not going to slide easy. So when we talk about your anti-slip soles, that's all got to do with coefficient of friction. I'm not sure that Crocs have a high enough coefficient of friction to be considered non-slip. Maybe the work Crocs, maybe the steel toe Crocs, I don't know. I know that if you buy the correct type of shoes that say non-slip, that's basically meaning the coefficient of friction is good enough. Now I'd like to add something to this. I've had customers have brake rotors rust and in an effort to get the brake rotors not to rust, request that we spray WD-40 all over the brake rotor. Now, I don't know why you're cracking up, but you somebody tell back to me, why is spraying WD-40 all over your brake rotors horrific? It is a lubricant. Right, so you just blew out your coefficient of friction. Lubricants reduce your coefficient of friction. This whole talk on kinetic energy going to heat energy relies on friction and these brake pads have a specific coefficient of friction and if i soak them in oil they no longer have that coefficient of friction so get your oil and get your sloppy brake pad grease we have to lubricate some parts of the brakes but we don't blob it all over the place take your oily hands and keep them Keep them off my brake pad lining. Keep them off of there. I'm walking here. I'm walking here. Yeah, keep them off of there. Okay, that's 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 one of the things you got to understand about brakes. We got to be very careful about grease and oil getting in our linings. And as we get more into the to the shoes and drums and uh, pads and rotors, we're going to discuss what happens if something like that does occur. Give you a clue. It's called replace. Okay, and then as we look at, you know, some of this heat and stuff, when we, when we use the brakes, drum brakes, for example, have shoes inside of a drum. Those are going to make, you use friction to make heat, but if you can imagine, we're going to heat the drum and then the drum is going to heat the air, right? Like here, right? We're heating the drum and then the drum is heating the air. And you can see we're, we're going to get some heat out of there. Some of the heat's going to go in the wheel under the tire. Some of it's going to pass through the spokes. Some of it's going to go out, you know, in the, in, in the inboard side. And then on disc, we're going to create, again, heat. But a lot of times we're going to have internal ventilation to help dissipate heat transferred from the outer surface. So if you look, a lot of times we'll have a backing plate, which is sometimes called like a, a dust shield or something. We're going to pull air through the backing plate. We're going to send it through the rotor. The rotor is hollow inside. It's vented. Not only is it vented, but on high performance, it may be also drilled and it may be slotted. And all of that is to get to dissipate as much heat as possible, right? So if you think about it, the drum is closed off. They can't dissipate heat that well. The disc is exposed. It gets a lot more airflow. It dissipates heat much better. Now do you understand why drum brakes are no longer allowed on the front of a vehicle starting in like 69 or whatever? They couldn't handle the heat. They were scary back then. I mean, if you came down the hill from Big Bear or something, you'd be riding your brakes and all of a sudden your brakes would be overheated and you wouldn't really be stopping anymore. And it was really scary. So that brings us to the next thing. Uh, fade. So heat fade is caused by buildup of heat in the, in the braking surface. So those shoes and those drums would actually be like heat glazed and they would get so, so polished and so shiny. They would no longer have a coefficient of friction that was good enough to stop and you couldn't stop. 
pretty wild, right? So anything that causes a reduction in stopping power is, is considered fade. That would happen on drums. Water fade was interesting. If you actually got your drums all wet, like soak going through water, they wouldn't stop all that well. When I'll be in on my motorcycle, to, uh, actually tomorrow I'm, I'm going to bring my Tesla and do some work, but on Friday I'll be in on my bike. Sometimes I ride my front brakes because my brakes on my bike are not really designed to be wet and they actually get water fade. So like if I'm cruising on the freeway for almost an hour and I get ready to go to Valley View and somebody cuts me off and I grab a handful of front brakes, it doesn't really stop. So by the time I know I'm going to use the brakes, I'll start riding them. Or if traffic gets kind of squirrely, I'll start riding them. And what'll happen is they'll get hot enough to boil the water out of them and dry them up. And I'll be like, all right, cool. I got brakes again. So like, this is for sure a real thing. You just don't really notice it on cars. Um, but maybe a little bit if it were drums. And then hydraulic fade is when the brake fluid becomes so hot that it boils. Now let's chat about that one. Dot three has a has a standard. Dot four has a standard. Dot five is a different type of brake fluid with a different standard. Um, if anybody's going to do a track day, this is one of the first things that people will do an upgrade on. Because if you go to a track day and you're braking hard doing autocross and whatever, and you have like older dot three especially, you could overheat your brake fluid. In which case, it will no longer be liquid, and it'll be a vapor because it boiled. When you hit the brake pedal, if it's no longer a liquid, it's going to be spongy. So you're going to have a type of brake fade where it's not going to be like, oh, my pedal's hard and it doesn't stop. Like both of these will be kind of like a hard pedal, but it doesn't stop. This is going to be like a mushy, spongy pedal. You don't have anything wrong with your friction linings. You have literally air in your brake fluid now because your brake fluid boiled. So they're two different types, but they're both considered brake fade. All right, cool. And then as we can tip and consider like a kind of a warm brake pedal would have a normal stopping distance. A really hot one would actually have an excessive stopping distance because look, that coefficient of friction is so low. That's what I was saying. They're polished. And here's your water fade. By the way, drums are designed to let the, the water run out. But if you go through like a water crossing, it'll fill it fast and it'll drain it a little bit slow. So it might take a little bit of time. And then here's your boiling point being hit. And there's actually now air in the system. Those are the three types of fade. Um, and then as we kind of look at like some of the rotation things, we're gonna, we're gonna have to understand there, we use fulcrums, we use leverage in the brake system. Like for example, um, when you pull up on the parking brake, you have a parking brake handle that's like say a foot long, that's gonna have a fulcrum and then it's gonna have a smaller end, almost like a teeter totter. Right. And so they design it in such a way where you'll pull the brake, the, the parking brake way up and it might only pull the cable this much, but it'll pull it with a lot more force. That's leverage. It's like a pry bar. There is essentially a bunch of different pry bars in the brake system. So we'll talk about that as well. Remember, this is a preview of the entire uh, eight week semester. So we got a lot to do. And then we got drum brakes. I'm gonna show you a picture that's covered in unit four. We got disc brakes. I'm gonna show you a picture that's covered in unit three. Both of them work together on the hydraulic system. That's covered in unit one. Um, and just for the record, like I mentioned, we have the brake pedal on the leverage to the booster, which operates on vacuum typically, to the hydraulic system, which is the master cylinder operating hydraulics, Brake lines going to all four of the wheels, disc brakes. I think these are disc brakes, but they could have been drum brakes too. So we got quite a bit to cover there, but that's going to be over the time. If you really wanted to get a little preview, I've shown you this. There is a mathematical formula created when you step on the brake pedal. A one inch stroke uh, or a, a one inch uh, surface area with a one inch stroke will become a hundred foot, a hundred PSI here. But if we had, let's say a one inch piston here, 
that would move the one inch with a hundred foot pounds. That's the same because it's the same one inch area to one inch area. But if you had double the area, you could double your foot pounds, 200 foot pounds. If you had quadruple the area, you can quadruple your pressure, 400 foot pounds. But in life, nothing is free. So there's a cost. Here's the cost. We, we moved this one inch, we got one inch. But when we doubled our pressure, we only got a half inch. When we quadrupled our pressure, we only got a quarter inch. So there's a, there's a law there. It's, it's a scientific law. We're going to cover that next week. But this is a fun preview. So you know where we're going. Even talking about how the system works with regard to vacuum, with regard to hydraulic assist, electric assist. Um, for example, this is hydraulic brakes, the pedal pushing on this, this rod. This rod is going through the booster. The booster is using engine power to boost the pressure, which is going into the hydraulic system. And we originate the hydraulic pressure already increased due to the booster, already increased due to the leverage. So we're like multiplying on multiplying on multiplying. That's why it doesn't take a lot of a strong leg to stop a big car because it's engineered to multiply force, right? And then air brakes, not something you're going to work on, but interesting to, to cover at this point. Like for example, if you're going to work on a truck, a tractor trailer, they will use air brakes. And I've had to troubleshoot air brakes a little bit. You'd have a good compressor. There's a regulator, a governor. There's going to be a dryer to keep it, you know, dry. And then there's going to be multiple circuits on there that we'd have to actually troubleshoot using um, pressure gauges. And the driver of a tractor trailer has to watch that pressure gauge. And if there's an issue, that driver would need to, you know, pull over before it becomes an issue. So air brakes are different, um, but some of the principles are kind of the same. Glad hands, for example, that's a type of a, of a coupling. The glad hand, you basically bring them up, lay them together, drop them down, and that'll join a hose. So you'll have a trailer with a glad hand hose and the truck with the glad hand hose, and you can put them together so that you can pass air into the trailer brakes to release them. But in the event of the trailer becoming disconnected, a tractor trailer splitting in two, that will tug the glad, glad hands apart. Now the truck may have air brake pressure, but the trailer doesn't. Does that sound horrifyingly scary or what? Default on air brakes is generally applied. So if a trailer disconnects, they apply. We actually use the air to release them. It's kind of ingenious if you think about it. So we're, we're essentially using the truck to release the brakes. And then if we separate it from it, they automatically apply. Okay, pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, this kind of goes into a little bit more of the, of the details. We won't cover air brakes, you know, all that much, but again, when we release the air or like if you shut the engine off slowly but surely the air is leaking out that's going to essentially function as a parking brake so those track those tractor trailers are they've got brakes on all the wheels and they're locked up pretty solid unlike our parking brakes which are typically on the rear only and so you know a little bit more that's the safety measure and then you can see we're going to use some different uh, chambers and cylinders to release these and we have a storage tank um, on those trucks now here's a cool one anyone ever heard of an exhaust brake anyone ever heard one when they go by that's what that is so we can use an exhaust brake um that's going to actually block off the exhaust, which is going to slow the engine down, but it doesn't work on the brake pedal. It more works on like engine braking. You'll, you'll let off the gas pedal on a manual and it'll slow down, right? Imagine if you could put your hand over the exhaust, it would slow down even more. The exhaust brakes can work really good. And this is the actual exhaust brake. So if you hear, you know, a truck, with the bra, 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 that's got nothing to do with the actual brakes or hydraulics or anything. It's a flapper on the exhaust. And it does work. Isn't really it cool. called J-breaking? Yeah, Jake break or J-break, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, true that. But for the technicians, more like, oh, the exhaust brake. You know, the Jake break would be more like what the driver would call it. Exactly. 
but they're cool. And then here's one that's an actual electric brake. Now, I wanna, the reason I really like to keep this here is this has nothing at all to do with, with regenerative braking for hybrids. This has to do with a trailer. So let's just say you bought, or maybe someday you guys will buy, like for me, when I got ready to uh, move to California, I bought a trailer, big, you know, uh, two axles, so four tires in a trailer. I hauled my toolbox, bikes, bunch of stuff. That had electric brakes. So I could put a brake controller in the truck and, to, and Tundras have these sometimes. You'll see one once in a while. You'd be like, what the heck is that? When you hit the brakes, it lights up. That takes the brake signal, makes it into the correct voltage and sends it to the trailer. And that signals these electric brakes to work. How they do it right here, there's electromagnet. If it's magnetized, it'll get pulled along. Let's say our drum is going, is going uh, clockwise. Let's make it clockwise. This electromagnet will kind of stick to the drum, right? And the drum will pull it to the left. And when it does, that pushes this shoe into the drum. And then when this shoe gets pushed into the drum, a lot of times it causes this shoe to get pushed into the drum. So there's a primary and secondary function. And that'll basically just drag the shoes while we're touching the brakes. Then if you release the brakes, it stops sending voltage. It discontinues the electromagnet. It turns it off and then it doesn't break. So they're not real strong, but they're great for trailers. Just getting some braking on a trailer will make it feel so much better than having no brakes on a trailer at all. It's a, it's a lot better. Not anything to do with a hybrid or electric vehicle at all. We will cover that though. All right, so, and then the driver can actually increase or reduce by using uh, a lever or buttons to fine tune it so the brakes don't lock up or not work at all. Cool, pretty good. Brake by wire will be a pretty quick explanation. Um, brake by wire means you're pressing the brakes, but you're not applying the fluid. You're basically pressing the brakes and the fluid goes to this module. And this module considers what it actually wants to do. And it can, it can ignore you or it can listen to you. But basically... You're, you're really just requesting the brakes and this thing says, yeah, give it some brakes or no, nah, no brakes or a little bit of brakes or a lot of brakes. Is that scary to you? I don't care. Don't scare me at all. It's double redundancies. They're actually really safe. So a Prius, for example, you press the brake pedal on the Prius. You may not even be applying the calipers at all. And that's why Prius brakes will last over 100,000. You'll press this pedal. It'll give you a little feedback. They call it a pedal travel simulator. Be like, oh, these brakes feel good. In the meantime, all it's doing is closed off. It's just making you feel safe. And then this thing's like, oh yeah, they applied you know, 50 pounds. So I'm gonna actually open up this valve. I'm gonna run this motor. I'm gonna use the fluid buildup in the accumulator and I'm gonna send it to the left and right front brakes. And I'm gonna send less to the left and right rear brakes all happening while you're driving. <clears throat> so the way we work on those tends to be a little different. If you go to bleed the brakes on this system, you're pumping this pedal, it may not be doing anything. Good luck bleeding the brakes. So there's a whole process, completely different service procedures on this design. And then it gets into a little bit more like some of the newer stuff is it, it's, uh, it's using it even on non-hybrids. You're it's basically the same as drive-by wire. On a new car, you press the pedal. The pedal sends a signal to the computer. The computer opens the throttle a certain amount. On, on a brake-by wire, you press the brake pedal. The brake pedal gives a signal to the brake module, and the brake module will apply the brakes in the amount that it sees fit. A little creepy, but they work really good. Okay, and then, like I said, it's they're a little bit different to... to to, to service, but the advantage of this. Weights reduced, space is saved, ABS brake pulsations are not felt, brakes apply quickly in emergency situations. So let's get, let's get to that. You have cars that have collision avoidance. You have cars where if they see a car in front of you, it'll break with you sleeping in the driver's seat. How did you think that happened? I mean, they're not magic. They've basically taken you, you're no longer in charge. The driver is no longer in charge. 
the driver is simply a requester of the brakes and the computer's in charge. I mean, there's movies about this. You know that, right? Like, what do you want to call it? Skynet? It's been named a few different things over the years. But the truth is the cars do work well. And remember, we're, we're, we're the engineers and stuff, they're designing what's going to sell. They're not designing what they think is going to be, you know, um, better for society they're 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 designing stuff that's going to put money in their pocket right so this allows people to sleep while driving essentially and that's i don't have any beef with it because you know what it's a little a little more technical to work on and that means there's less people who are going to be willing to work on it which means people who can work on it can charge more money sorry people that's how the world works but it's good for you because you're going to be here learning about it so we'll do quite a bit about that the drawbacks, risk of the system failure, which is very minimal, and and probably more relevant, higher initial costs. It's freaking expensive. How's that sound? Now we're almost there, but let me let me explain a little bit about regen braking. So regen braking, we're talking EVs, we're talking hybrids. This is not braking at all, really. If you think about it. So remember the brake by wire, you hit the brake pedal. Remember what you do? You request the brakes are applied. With regen, it's gonna say, yeah, no, let's not do that. It's gonna basically vary the frequency of your three phase AC motor in your hybrid or electric vehicle in such a way that it's gonna slow it down. Make sense? It's using the motor. Okay, I'll dumb it down for you. It basically stops the motor from functioning as a motor and it makes it a little bit more like a generator. That's pretty much what it does. There's a technical explanation for how it does that. But this entire time, you're pressing the brake pedal and you know what your brake pads are doing? Nothing. They're just like hanging out, just like, just like this. Just hanging out. But in the meantime, this computer is working with your AC motor and saying like more regen braking, decrease the frequency more, act more like a generator, slow us down, slow us down, slow us down, slow us down. Because if you think about it, your foot makes a certain amount of pressure. It takes that pressure and makes it into a voltage. It interprets that voltage and it commands the generator to reproduce what you're asking for. So to you, you're like, oh, these brakes feel great. <laughs> That's not real. That's not real life. Like the matrix, when they're saying, oh, the steak is so good and there is no steak. There is no break. You never, you never breaked anything. It all happened behind the scenes. But on the positive, when we're using that hybrid braking, that regen braking, we're gonna basically use the AC motor to slow it down. And the byproduct is it makes a bunch of electricity. So what do you think we should do with that electricity? Convert the AC to DC for power. And send it back to the battery. So literally you're, you're pressing the brake pedal as long as it's fairly lightly on a hybrid or EV, it's literally just charging your battery up, charging your battery up. Remember way back there when we were looking at that car with all that potential energy and it went down the hill and we arrested that kinetic energy and made it into heat energy? That's really inefficient if you think about it. It's safe and, it, and, I'm, and I'm happy for it. But like, if we could only take that energy and like take all that potential and that kinetic energy, turn it into electrical energy and then use it to propel us up the next hill, that's your hybrid, that's your EV. Your EVs work like that. Now, every EV could be slightly different or your hybrid can be slightly different. The, the Toyotas are very, they're very uh, efficient with that. Like my Tesla, for example, I assumed it was closer to a Toyota. When I lightly touch the brake pedal on my Tesla, it's applying the brake pads. I'm kind of like, why? Ramp up the region. So all you can do on a Tesla is let off the gas and the regen will do its thing. As soon as you start braking, you are starting to use the brake pads a little bit. So Tesla brakes may last 50,000, Priuses will last 100. See, so like the way the Toyota does it, I think is actually more efficient. Um, and so again, when you hear regen or braking, it has nothing to do with the brake pads, the rotors, the calipers, the axles, it's none of that crap. It's all happening 
in the transaxle in the electric motor providing all that braking there's no fluid even involved right that's covered in chapter five so in summary Here's what we did. We covered the course introduction, so now you know what the class is going to include. You're not trying to necessarily really understand all of what I said. You're just saying like, okay, I heard about regen. We're going to learn about it later. All right, I heard about brake booster. We're going to learn about it later, right? Torque. But this you should actually know. So we introduced everything in the course. Torque you actually need to know. So if I give you a job tomorrow, you need to be able to torque stuff, set up a torque wrench, et cetera. I'll help you, but we've covered it. Right, the three C's of do in documentation, concern, cause, correction, or concern, cause, and repair or remedy. So we're on that, you know that now. And then here's an overview of the next five units one more time. We're gonna do hydraulics, we're gonna do power assist, we're gonna do disc brakes, drum brakes, brake electronics. This is gonna get us to the midterm right here. I believe spring brake lands dead in the middle. So we're gonna knock out brakes, you're going to nail that A5 at the midway point. Do not show up to the second part, which is uh, suspension without A5. Cool. So we're focused right here on brakes big time for the next, I guess it's technically under eight weeks, but counting today, it's eight weeks. Okie dokie.